Good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is April 6, 2017. Um, may I have attendance, please? Mrs. Bealy? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Mrs. Massengill? Here. Mrs. Murphy? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Ms. Hobbs? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Thank you. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That, that takes us right to item 4.0, adjustments to the agenda. And we adjusted it earlier um, on the published agenda, but just for clarification tonight, since the previous calendar we reviewed did not have um, dates of professional development, late starts, or times, um, they weren't included on that, and it's obviously a topic of great interest. We've decided to do a first reading tonight on the completed calendar options. So we'll have a first reading tonight, and then um, we assume a second reading April 27th at our next regular board meeting. Um, that way we ensure that everyone's had the time available to look at um, the options with the, the professional development days and the times on it before we make our final decision. So tonight will just be a first reading. And that was an adjustment, like I said, um, the agenda you're picking up tonight already reflects that. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Uh, there are none. Okay. And I will just tell you, since we have a big crowd, our agendas can be deceiving. Um, a lot of stuff's going to happen <laughs> in all these, all these item numbers. So um, settle in. Okay, so moving on to 5.0, public comments on agenda items. We um, run our public comments a little differently than the town council. So if anyone has anything they want to comment on um, that's on the agenda tonight, this is the time you would comment. So whether it's the budget, uh, the calendar, um, the <laughs> Department of Education, applications for um, building funds, anything on the agenda tonight, this is the time where you'd have the opportunity to come and speak. Um, it's uh, three minutes per topic, and we ask that you please start with your name and address, and um, avoid duplication of comments, so um, just so we can Keep moving because depending on how many people come up, we could be here for a while. So, um, with that, public comment is open. If anyone would like to come and um, speak about a topic on the agenda tonight, please do so now. And feel free to line up if you are. If there's already somebody there, just somebody else make a line. Hi, my name is Helen Griffin. I live at 15 Jamico Mill Road, Scarborough, Maine. And I am against the new proposed start time for the high school students mostly, because that's what I have. I have a lot of people that I know that are against it as well. They're not here. I'm not going to speak to them. So my, my concern is going to be very personal, what I'm going to read off to you. My concern is how this change is going to negatively affect my daughter who's in the college um, process right now. She's a junior. Next year, she'll be a senior. So just one more year, that's all I care about. But I'm sure there's lots of people that care about more than that. Um, concerns are relating to scholarship opportunities for my daughter, because the cost of attendance of going to college is a lot of money. Why does a um, start time impact scholarship opportunities? I'll tell you why. First off, Scarborough High School students are already at a disadvantage when taking national standardized tests, such as the SATs or the AP exams. AP exams are in May, uh, in May, right? And it doesn't matter when your start time is as far as we start in August or Labor Day. Some schools start at the beginning of August. Okay, so we're already at a disadvantage with a national test like that because sometimes we have snow days that impact us. You know, and we have a couple of days that are less than people that start at the beginning of the um, the calendar year. Okay. There's also extensive late starts. Every Wednesday, high school level kids have late starts almost. Not 100%, but probably like 95%. So that's taken away from instructional time. My daughter's hoping to get a merit scholarship, so she's already behind the eight ball with the AP examinations because of these um, late starts and because of snow days and because our calendar year starts later. 
Now all of a sudden, we're going to change the start time of the school. How that's going to negatively impact her is because she's a, she's a swimmer. Scarborough High School, or Scarborough doesn't have a pool. We've been trying to get a pool for years. Since my daughter was in kindergarten, my older one, we've been trying to get a pool here, and we don't. So she club swims. She club swims outside the town of Scarborough because we don't have a pool. They do not care what one Scarborough kid is going to do as far as their schools to ours, right? They care about the majority of the population in the place where the school is held. So um, my daughter swims at a club that has practices right after school. You change the start time, she's not going to be able to swim, miss practice, or she's going to have to drop classes so she can go to class go to club practice. By missing classes, she's taking off of instructional time, and that's going to negatively affect her in the college application process. She's already being looked at by several colleges um, for her academics, but for her swimming. She's um, talking to coaches right now, and if she misses, her, if she misses practice, her times are going to go down, and the people are going to be looking at her and saying, we're not interested in you because you're, you're no longer a competitive athlete. So that's how it's going to negatively affect us. Um, she is in the top 10% of her class, so she's not a slacker. She's a smart kid, and that's why we do not want the start time to be pushed out later because she won't be able to make practice or she'll have to choose not to take classes. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jennifer Cleary, and I reside at 33 Meeting House Road. <coughs> Thank you to all of our school board members and administration for your time and dedication to our students and community. You put in many, many hours, and your efforts are truly appreciated. I have three boys who currently attend Scarborough High School. We have had several interesting debates in our home regarding the proposed changes to start time. All three boys remain in opposition of the change. With all the reading I have done on this subject over the past week, I have no doubts that the science is sound. I do, however, feel the survey indicates that our students, parents, and teachers feel there will be no impact or a negative impact in students' ability to focus, complete homework, etc. If you combine the no impact and negative impact responses from the survey, these percentages clearly overshadow the positive impact percentages. For our high school teachers, there was only one category where the positive responses were higher than the negative. Our elementary level parents and teachers report no impact or negative impact for all categories. Our teachers see firsthand how well our children are able to focus, their mood and ability to complete homework, etc. Science can indicate the best time for adolescents to go to sleep and the amount of sleep they need, but science cannot ensure this is what will take place. The mentality and nature of a teenage person plays a role, and this cannot be measured. To use the, wo the words of a community better, member, I want better. If we accept the science and feel this is a critical change to make for our students, the solution should absolutely be what is best for each phase level. We should be aligning with the science and biology to set our start, start times as close to or on spot with the recommended times. I believe there are now three proposals on the table for next year's start times. I believe this happened yesterday or today. Thank you for providing these options. In my opinion, option two may not get us to the ideal start time based on science, but has far less negative connotations than the other option three. I personally vote for option one. Leave it as it is. I hope everyone in the district weighs in on this issue. Thank you all for your time, and I look forward to supporting the budget process in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Should I wait for it to stop? I to start talking. Um, oh, good. good. Um, my name is Brent Crossman. I live in Barley Lane. I've got two kids. One's a six-year-old. The other's nine. So these will be affecting me for a while. Not that it's not important for the people next year as well. And I do urge the um, school board to, to take all that into account and think if there's ways to make it to make it work and, and deal with some issues that get raised. But I think I'm here primarily to speak for the average. And for me, like that, 
when I look at the science and I see, you know, what it's doing to high schoolers that have to try to fight the biology of bedtime that's at least three hours later on average or, or a natural sleep cycle that's that much later than the younger kids and then get up and have school an hour and a half before the younger kids, it just, I, I would think they should be flipped. I think you would start the younger kids, you know, uh, an hour and a half after the high schoolers, given that differential of the of the sleep cycles. But I also understand, you know, if I if I look at it that way and I think, okay, well that's, um, you know, the high schoolers starting at 9:30, and I read comments and see what everyone says about how much that minimizes their ability to do things after school. Well, you, you try to compromise, right? You bring that in to uh, to nine o'clock, or you or if you say, well, geez, you want that at nine o'clock, but now we we don't want the the little ones getting up at 7:30 for various reasons. Well, you, you see if you can squish that, and, and I, I think the school board's done a great job of doing that and finding ways to balance all those competing demands and the science. I mean, the science says older kids are going to have a sleep cycle that's later than younger kids by at least three hours. It's actually three hours later than adults, but much later than younger kids. And so they do need a little bit less sleep. I think the um, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends uh, nine hours for the older kids and ten and a half on average for six-year-olds. So there's that difference we make up there, but it doesn't make up for the sleep cycle. So you still end up with this issue of I think in order to give them the best chance, and the, I do think the science has shown that when you push off those sleeps, uh, the, the start times, not only does it have positive effects in their grades, in their you know, mental health, that they are taking advantage of it. I think it was twice as many kids were getting the necessary sleep when you push them off in the studies that were done in Minnesota and Colorado. So I think it's effective science. I think option three is already a good compromise between those those competing factors of trying not to have the kids get on too early and trying not to have the um uh, and trying to make sure the teenagers get the sleep that they're going to get so i would i would strongly urge um option uh, option three if that's at all possible and, and i and i do think it for me for me i think it it would work perfectly i mean the idea of like a eight o'clock start time and my kids getting on the bus at seven thirty, and you know i put them to bed at eight o'clock they get their ten and a half hours of sleep they're up at six thirty. they they've got an hour to get ready i mean in my mind that's a great schedule that school boards put together. So I would, uh, I would urge you guys to continue to balance the science against competing demands that are going to always be out there. And, um, and I would support option three. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Jubilis. I live at 16 Haystack Circle. And I'm a practicing pediatrician in the area as well as a mother of a kindergartner. So as a practicing pediatrician, the health and well-being of all children of all ages is my primary concern. But as the parent of a kindergartner, I am also concerned about how these time changes will affect her and our family. The proposed school start time change may have an effect on improving school performance of older adolescents, but it may also be detrimental to younger school-aged children. Biologically, it makes sense. Adolescents produce melatonin peaks later in the evenings, and so they require a later sleep pattern. And studies cite this as evidence for improved academic performance. However, studies from Canada describe that for every 10-minute delay in school start times, there are only 3.2 additional minutes of sleep per adolescent. So delaying one hour buys you approximately 20 extra minutes of sleep. A study from Hong Kong describes, based on self-assessment, better social behavior and mental health in a school where start times were made later by 15 minutes in a high school age population. But this time was from 7.45 to 8 a.m., hardly comparable to our situation of moving high school start times to almost 9 a.m. And we're doing this at what cost? The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that children in the primary school age group get to between 10 and 13 hours of sleep per night. Making elementary school times earlier, as we are, will require some children to have to go to bed around 6.30 to achieve this time standard and still make the bus. And this means limited family time, which as we know is a big indicator of future success for children, and this is particularly true for families with two working parents. It means minimal after-school activities, such as dance or music or sports, as children will again need to ha have an earlier bedtime. And again, this will hit working parents particularly hard with the school release time for elementary school age children before 3 p.m., these activities will occur earlier in the afternoon and our children will not be able to participate as we will not be able to get them there. I understand these activities are not viewed as, imp as, as important for younger children, but I would urge you to consider how this would affect them going into high school when they don't have these backgrounds. 
Um, I also believe that what will happen is that younger children will get less sleep, and a sleep-deprived elementary school student is more likely to manifest behavior challenges, ADHD-type behaviors, or learning and attentiveness difficulties. When I see a child with concerns for ADHD, one of the first questions we ask is how much sleep they're getting at night. As a pediatrician and a parent, I agree, we need to make things better. And I could support a later start time for high school students, but not option three, the nine o'clock start time, as I feel this will not make the improvements we seek and will do so at the expense of our younger students. Option two is a reasonable compromise with a later start time for older students and minimal effects on the younger ones. Thank you for your consideration and all of your hard work in this effort. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, board members, Superintendent Cooper, and community members. My name is Sarah Bailey. I reside at 7 Summerfield Lane. I'm the mother of a first grader at Pleasant Hill and a preschooler who will be entering kindergarten in 2018. I stand before you tonight opposed to the option three start time for Scarborough schools. I feel that the proposed times were made in haste and on the coattails of other districts. While I appreciate that there are now two additional proposed options, the decision about the start times should address the needs of everyone, students, teachers, bus drivers, and especially parents. Option three does not do this. However, a late start, excuse me, although a late start time is supported by academic research, the reality is that high school students will still not get the recommended amount of sleep. They will continue to have longer days, trying to fit in homework with after school activities, practices that will run longer, games that will require students to have to leave instructional time in order to get somewhere and missed vital family time. Those students who rely on after-school jobs or are responsible for younger siblings will leave parents and the community having to look elsewhere. Now, please keep in mind that I have mostly addressed high school students because the reality is this is where your support to research focused on. However, there's a forgotten vital part to this and it lies with the K through two students. That option three leaves five-year-olds standing in the dark hours of winter days waiting for a bus that their little bodies need an exuberant amount of sleep in order to be ready to tackle their next day of school, that these children participate in after-school activities and love nothing more than to spend time with their families in the evening sharing about their day. This will all be cut short because the reality is now these children will have to go to bed between the hours of 6 and 7 p.m., that they'll have to eat dinner at 5 p.m. before parents are home from work. They'll need baths at 6, books, followed by quick songs and quick kisses goodnight. These are vital times that we have with our young children that we want to cherish for as long as we can. It should not be rushed. If option one cannot continue, we feel as a family that option two gives the community and school board an opportunity to come together. This compromise is a smaller change and will demonstrate how changing the schedule affects everyone. The school board cannot deny the fact that there are multiple stakeholders at the table and change can be effective when voices are heard and we work together. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. My name is Sophie Kelly and I live at 3 Sandy Point Road. I am a first grader at Pleasant Hill School. I go to bed at 7 o'clock, and I get up between 7 and 7.30. I am still little and growing, and I need my sleep, uh, sleep too. I do a lot of after-school activities like dance and swimming and soccer and gymnastics and Girl Scout daisies and ice skating and cross and cross country. If I have to go to bed, one to one and a half hours earlier next year, I will not be able to do all my favorite activities anymore. And that doesn't seem fair to me. But most importantly, once my mom goes back to work and if I have to go to bed so early, I pretty much wouldn't be able to see her during the week anymore. And that me makes me really, really sad. My dad died when I was two, and it doesn't seem very nice that my sister and I wouldn't get to see our mom because she's at work until until when we have to go to bed. If you change my start time to 8 o'clock, I think my friends and I will 
get less sleep, and it's really not a good thing when little kids don't get good sleep. My five-year-old sister sleeps even more than I do, and she is crazy when she doesn't get in her sleep. Please don't change my start time to 8, eight o'clock. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Good evening. My name is Julie Bassett, and I also live at 3 Sandy Point Road in Scarborough. I've lived here for 12 years. I have seven and five-year-old children. I'm a single parent. Switching K2 to an 8 a.m. start time would be a huge hardship for my little family. My children already go to bed at 7 and sleep 12 to 13 and a half hours each night. To have to put them to bed at 5.30 or 6 next year so that they may keep getting the same amount of adequate sleep seems very far-fetched and would basically prevent them from having to rely from being able to continue with their after-school activities most of which rely on parent coaches and volunteers who are only getting out of work at the time my children would now need to be in bed. I believe, believe these activities, such as sports and Girl Scouts, are vitally important to their well-being. Even more importantly, it would also make it really hard for a lot of K-2 age children to see their working parents during the school week, and that just doesn't seem right. It's my belief that exchanging one group's sleep challenges for another's does not make any sense at all. A recent study out of Kentucky suggested that delaying middle school and high school start times at the expense of making elementary school start times earlier might be a bad idea. Their findings suggested that these policy changes may simply be shifting the problem from adolescents to younger children instead of eliminating it altogether. In my eyes, it's simply common sense that each group of students in Scarborough deserves their sufficient sleep. As such, I strongly urge the board to consider option one or option two as a compromise that includes smaller start time changes as a starting point and then to reassess at a future date. I'm of the hope that once the bus audit results are in, some additional positive tweaks may be made to the start changes as well. Please don't make a change that hurts families like mine. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Zenkla. I live at 32 Orchard Street. I have a kindergartner and I have a two and a half year old toddler. Um, thank you very much for all the options you've put together. I think you've done a wonderful job. Um, and I want to start with the goal that you set out in the document that was sent out, and that is to keep the success and well-being of all students at the forefront. So let's just concentrate on all. Your research um, suggests that starting high school students, older students later has the benefits. And probably nobody can deny that. But there is very little or no research that suggests that starting little kids earlier has benefits. Your relevant findings state that um, compromised learning by sleep-deprived students negatively impacts teacher effectiveness, yet 38 to 40 percent of little kids' parents feel that early start times would have negative impact on those kids. So what we're really doing is we're benefiting older kids at the expense of the little children, the smallest members of our community. And it's not even that the um, survey found that 100% of high school students or older kids will benefit. It's only 50% or more. It's not 90% or more. And yet, we're compromising 40% of little kids' sleep. And let me turn to those 38 to 40% of those families. I am one of those families, and I see some of those families over here. A lot of those families have a little child. They might have a newborn, and those are the most vulnerable families in our community. Um, they just, a lot of them, and my family including, they just took that big sigh of relief when we wrote that last paycheck to the daycare that was draining our financial situation for years and years. And now, according to the survey, we're going to whack on the head 44% of those families and say, no, you've got to pay after care. So I want you to consider that as an important factor. And let's look back at the research. It states that early um, 8 a.m. is the optimal learning time for little kids, but the research didn't say what time those kids got up. They might have gotten up at 7.45. They might have gotten up at 7.30, maybe 6 o'clock. We'll never know that. Yet 38% of our little children will automatically be disadvantaged. So why should we wonder that maybe 5 or 10 years from now we'll see them not hitting the marks when they enter Wentworth? Please consider that as a factor. And to finish off, I want to say that I don't believe this community cannot come to an agreement. Let's not follow the trends, and let's not be the first. Let's leave those things like trends to fashion magazines. I think this community is a wonderful one, and we can work hard to put the little members at the front. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Kimberly Duffy Sawyer. I reside at Seven Lawton Circle. I grew up in Scarborough, attended Scarborough schools, and graduated from Scarborough High School. I moved back 11 years ago to start my own family here. I have a seven-year-old daughter attending first grade at Blue Point. I'm active on the Scarborough Primary PTA, I'm a Girl Scout leader in town, and I volunteer at my daughter's school on a weekly basis. I am very pro-Scarborough schools, our teachers and administration, and the Scarborough Board of Education. I feel that option two is an ideal compromise. The study is provided by the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the American Academy of Pediatrics that the board references in their endorsement of later start times for high school students also recommend 10 to 13 hours of sleep for our four and five-year-old kindergartners and first graders, as well as nine to 12 hours of sleep for our six to 12-year-old students. We cannot reference these recommendations as a basis for later start times for our high school students and then dismiss them for our primary school students. <coughs> Comments that most children in the six to 12 age range are going to need less than 12 hours of sleep are the equivalent of my stating that most high school students do not need to stay up until 11 or 12 p.m., that a 9 or 10 p.m. bedtime is fine for them. My seven-year-old is in bed by 8 p.m. I have to wake her at 7.45 to be at the bus on time. On weekends, she will sleep until 8.30. If primary school start times are moved forward to 8 a.m. with buses starting at 7 a.m., these children will need to be in bed between 5.15 and 6.15 to achieve the amount of sleep they require. This is simply not realistic. <clears throat> Health research shows that our high school students would benefit from a later start time, and I am in favor of that. I support what is best for all of our students. I cannot, however, support this change for the high school by sacrificing the health of our youngest students. In order to implement this change for the high school, I feel the Board of Education and our school department must be tasked with finding a solution that benefits all students. I feel that in option two, they have done so. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jessica Ramsey, and I reside on Fairfield Road here in Scarborough. I have a seven-year-old, or almost seven-year-old, and a five-year-old um, that attend Scarborough schools. My five-year-old will start in the fall. Um, I first want to say that I support the budget that's going on um, here in the city or town. Um, secondly, I'm adamantly opposed to the earlier start times for my children and children in the Scarborough school system. Um, primarily, I work in public safety. My schedule um, is not a great schedule, and I know that I already limit the time with my children to serve others, um, and that's a choice I made. Um, but I also don't want to come home at 5 o'clock at night and have to turn around and put my child right to bed. I enjoy spending time reading and singing with them. Um, I also enjoy um, raising them. I don't want to put my children in daycare every day on the days that um, I can avoid it. Um, part of waking them up in the morning um, is not nice. It's not pleasant for me. I don't enjoy having to struggle to get them dressed and get them out the door for 9 o'clock already. I cannot imagine an earlier start time for my children. I know that's just my children, but I also know that I have um, friends that have children their age that um, do the same thing. Um, I also feel that um, it limits um, their after-school activities. Um, it also limits my ability to get babysitters if you have the high schoolers starting later and getting out later. I rely heavily on high school students, um, and that it will definitely affect that. Um, this is my daughter, McKinley. Do you want to start school earlier? Mm. You do? <laughs> <laughs> you want to wake up early? No, she doesn't. So I, I know that it affects her when I wake her up early to get her to daycare before school, um, and she has a miserable day, and I can't imagine putting that burden on the teachers of Scarborough. Um, I think she needs her sleep and deserves the 12, 13, almost 14 hours of sleep she gets a night now by putting her to bed at 7 o'clock. So... I, um, if option one isn't an option, I would say option two is a good compromise. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Barney Martin. I'm at 17 Foxville Drive. Um, I raised in midstream with four children that I've raised here in Scarborough quite successfully. Thank you to you all. Uh, I appreciate these options that have come up regarding sleep. Uh, I'm in the middle. I've got teens right now, and if you have teens, sleep 
is huge. Mm -hmm. But the way that it is shifted right now seems to be working in that <coughs> they go to school, they get out of school, and the amount of activities that go on that I'm in, try to get them to and fro and get dinner and help with homework, whatever was going on, it's getting them to bed is my, is my responsibility. And when they have the late start day, it's, oh, boy, I can stay up a little later. That's a team. That's what they do. They, they, if they can start later in the morning, they're going to go to bed later at night. And it's a parent that's going to stop that, granted. But that's going to be the tendency right there. And so I don't think shifting it is really going to help at all. I think leaving it just the way it is, I think, I think that's option one. I think that's what we need to do. I've been hearing a lot of great testimony here tonight uh, with the citizens here, so I don't want to re repeat anything that's been said here. But I just want to talk about a teen brain that I have observed, and that is if they can sleep later, they're going to go to bed later. And uh, the activity thing is huge, and that's going to push them even later. I was late coming here tonight because of track. You know, I'm just getting out now. Now, next year, that's going to be 8 o'clock. So it's going to be tough for me to even manage things like this to get to a town meeting or something. So I think just living the way it is is perfect, and it's been working great for almost all my children. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Stroud. I live at 8 Surrey Lane, and I have a uh, first grader at Blue Point. I want to thank the board and the school administration and the community members on the work they've done in addressing this school start time issue. As well intended as the process was, my concern is that the solution creates new challenges for families and teachers by significantly increasing the need for childcare and its accompanying expense and, and also impacts existing family schedules. It's cl this is clearly evidence in the survey results that you released. Because school, because school start time research is basically non-existent for ages 6 through 12, it seems we're betting there will be no impact on this age group until there is a study years from now. Some significant assumptions are being made that a later school start time, quote, will afford all students the opportunity to get the recommended amount of sleep and reap the benefits associated with well with being well rested in learning at the optimal times of, de of their developmental level. High school has had late starts on Wednesdays during the school year. Is there any evidence that students are getting more sleep? Is there any evidence that car accidents are not occurring on Wednesdays? That was one of the positive aspects that was announced in the communication. When my now adult sons went through Scarborough High School, it was explained that middle school prepared you for high school and high school prepared you for the next step in your life, whether it be college, work, military service. I strongly believe that we're sending a very mixed message to our students with this proposed change. No college freshman is going to be able to go to a professor and ask that their 8 o'clock start time class can be changed because they want to sleep in. Or, a or, or get a positive response from an employer for a late start time and request a nap for the afternoon. We all know motivated students who are involved in sports or extracurricular activities that due to ice or pool availability times get up early, go to practice, and meet or exceed their academic responsibilities because they've learned to manage their time appropriately. There is no question that the need for a good night's sleep for students and for adults for that matter is important. 25 years of scientific study isn't needed to prove this, it's common sense. Obtaining appropriate, the appropriate amount of sleep results solely with each individual student and parents, not the school board and not school administration, as well-intentioned as you may be. Scarborough can be proud of the educational leadership it enjoys in this community and our state. However, Later school start times is not an initiative that demands Scarborough's leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kirsten Denham, and I'm a junior at Scarborough High School. 
And um, as a high school student, I'd like to just point out that in Scarborough, it's very, very focused on getting into college. So, you know, literally yesterday I took the SAT. Um, and so, you know, everybody's focused on getting into college, and everybody has to have a way to pay for that. Um, me personally, I'll be paying for college myself, you know. Um, but the way that I'm going to do that is by having a job after school. But if you make the start time later, that means we be out later. So, I mean, if we get out later, that cuts back on the amount of time that we have to work. Um, it means less pay, less money saved up for college. It's going to make it that much more difficult to pay for school. Um, and there's so many kids at Scarborough that have jobs. I mean, I'd say a good 75% of kids have it. And, um, you know, there's also people who have jobs, babysitting people who have, you know, younger kids. Um, so, you know, when we get out of school, we might go and pick up their kids and watch their kids after school. But if those kids are getting out before us, who's going to watch them? So, I mean, it's either that or a daycare, but, you know, there's only so many, so many people that can fit into there. Um, also, businesses around here kind of rely on having high school students to work there. Um, for example, I know, like, tons and tons of kids work at Piper Shores. You guys know what that is, like the nursing home or something. Um, I mean, if they don't have high school kids to work there after school, I, that's going to be a problem. I mean, they need people. Um, Scarborough Grounds, I know, uh, it's like some trampoline place, like, they're, they're all staffed by high school students. So I don't know who's going to work those. Uh, it's going to be a problem. Um, it doesn't change sleep amount. I mean, I know teachers here, Mr. Chancellor, you know, late start days, we don't get any more sleep. We're just up that much later doing whatever. So it's kind of foolish to think that we're going to go to bed earlier or, you know, go to bed on time and get that extra sleep. We're not. <laughs> I'm going to be very, very honest. If there's any high school students here, can you raise your hand if you actually get more sleep on late start days? Tom, come on. <laughs> well, I have to be honest. All right, Tom's on. Sorry. All right. So, I mean, it's like kind of a bit here, but I mean, and teachers, I'm sure, can contest with that too. We don't get any more sleep. So, that's, it's just not going to help. Um, and a point that I don't want to be taken as a joke, but I think it probably needs to be brought up. The more time you give kids in the morning, the more times they have to get high and go to school. Like, that sounds like a joke, but I actually have teachers who have said that that, that could be an issue. Um, you know, the more time you give them in the morning, the more high kids you're going to have coming into school, school, basically. So that should be interesting, see where that goes. Um, that, one more thing about sports. I do sports, you know, all three seasons, all year round. Um, I know that not every school is on this new schedule yet. So, I mean, if we have, like, you know, I do track. If we go to a meet that starts at 4 o'clock, but I'm not getting out until 3, we're going to be late to that meet. And, you know, those other schools aren't going to wait for us. And, like, athletics is such a huge, huge thing at Scarborough, so that's going to be an issue. That or we're going to be dismissed early from school. I've heard that much. That's a rumor, but that's not going to work with teachers. Um, yeah, so I just, I, I see no, no benefits um, to this. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Kristen Allen. I live at 34 Woodfield Drive. Um, I'll be brief. Um, I just... First, I think you can't ignore the research. I think that we have to make a change. Um, I would not be comfortable leaving it as is. I think 7.30 is very early for anybody. Um, I understand that there's concerns with the third option, um, and I'm not looking to suggest that we ignore any population of Scarborough. I think option two seems to be a good compromise, um, and I've heard a few people say that as well. The concern I have with that is that 8 o'clock for the high school isn't quite what the research is saying that we should be doing. Um, I think the ideal situation would be to be able to afford to bus everybody to school at a reasonable start time, um, <coughs> which ties into the budget that I know that you're going to be discussing tonight. Um, I think if there's any possibility that we can get that at some point, if we make a change, to the 8 o'clock start time for next year, it's a move in the right direction and trying to find a place in the budget to be able to bus more kids closer to the same time um, would be the, the ideal option. So I know that um, it's very unlikely that that would happen this year given the circumstances that we're in <laughs> with losing so much money from the state of Maine. Um, if by some miracle we get some kind of windfall at that point when we vote in June, 
I'd love to see more money allocated to this. I've heard that we've had a shortage of bus drivers and some other things, so, um, you know, I'm glad to see everybody here, though, uh, hopefully to also hear about the budget because that is one of the reasons why we are in the situation where we are, where we can't bus all of the kids, you know, closer to the same time or at least to a time where everybody feels comfortable and reasonable that they're going to get enough sleep and be able to get to bed at the right time. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mike Clisham. <clears throat> I live at Seven Springbrook Lane and I have a kindergartner in the Blue Point School and another one coming in. And <clears throat> I've been really impressed watching the deliberative process that you've gone throughout this. And I see potential benefits in helping, in option three, helping the elementary students transition to a school environment and be prepared and avoiding undue disruption in their day. Um, right now our kid, our daughter, um, is up at six. She goes to a before care facility where she's picked up by the bus, she's at Blue Point, and she's back. And so there's a lot of focus on getting ready in the morning, getting out the door, getting to before care, having what we need, coming back. And as I watch this as a parent with a child in the primary school system, I see what that does in terms of getting her grounded and ready to focus in her first year and how the option three ushers those kids in without a lot of competing distractions in the morning, gets them focused. Our, our kids are awake and bright eyed and I think we're very fortunate um, in that regard. Um, we don't face some of the challenges that I'm, I'm hearing. But what I see is that this potential has the benefit to really streamline that entry process and avoid the disruption that really gets them focused and gets the most out of that experience during the day. So thank you for your work and thank you for receiving comments. Thank you. Hi, my name is Claire Merrill of 29 Jamico Mill Road. I'm a sophomore at Scarborough High School and today I just want to take you through what an average day looks like for me and how this time change will affect me. So I go to school from 7.30 to 2 o'clock and then from about 2.30 to 4 o'clock I go to tennis practice and then from 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock I go to rehearsal for the spring musical. Till about 7 o'clock I go home, eat dinner and at 7 o'clock I begin homework. I probably do homework from about 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock but at 10 o'clock I get tired and I can't focus anymore. It's a long day and when it comes down to it at night, I get tired, I get stressed, and I can't do homework anymore. So I go to bed around 11.30 after I shower, pack for the next day, and catch up on everything I need to catch up on. The proposed 8.50 start time would push all of these activities back an hour and 20 minutes, leaving me to go to bed at around 12.30. It would affect the quality of my homework because I would be doing homework even later in the night, which already isn't working for me. I'm not going to bring up all of the logistical complications to this change, as I'm sure they've already been brought up and everyone's considered them. Instead, I ask you to consider this. Science says that getting more sleep is beneficial for students. That's obvious. That's not a lie. Of course, more sleep will have a positive impact on test scores, on the general health of the community, and on academic lives. However, as one student of Scarborough High School, speaking on behalf of many of my peers, this schedule change will not increase the amount of sleep I get each night. It only pushes my schedule off. My body will adjust and my sleep cycle will be pushed back an hour and 20 minutes. There's no change. This change negatively impacts many of my extracurricular activities. As president of the sophomore class and a member of many clubs such as Chorus, Natural Helpers, and the theater team, I, if I do not get out of school until 3.15, I'll have no choice but to back out of some, act, some of these activities. There's simply not enough time in the day to do everything I want to do. The possibility of feeling better rested in the morning is not strong enough to outweigh all of these complications. With that, I ask you to look beyond what the statistics are saying and listen to the complaints and concerns that the students of Scarborough High School are feeling and how it's going to affect us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sylvia Rasmal, a student at Scarborough High School, and I live on Foxville Drive. I am against school start times being pushed later. Pushing school start times later pushes the end of the school day later, which just shifts the entire day later. I have written an article on start times for the school newspaper, and the National Sleep Foundation says you cannot put more hours in the day. Students will be going to bed later due to after-school activities running later, 
giving students the same amount of sleep as without the time change. So the argument that shifting start times later will allow high schoolers to get more sleep is null. Please, keep school start times the way they are. Thank you. Thank you. My name is April Sither. I live at 14 Huntley Drive. I have a first grader at Blue Point. I will have a kindergartner at Blue Point next year. I have a two and a half year old and I also have a baby on the way. Um, so I am a Scarborough graduate. My husband is a Scarborough graduate. Our history with the town is long and our future is equally as long. Um, I won't, I'll respect everyone's uh, time and I won't say anything redundant, but one thing I did want to point out was the high school is proposing a lot of changes. Um, block scheduling, I know, is on the docket as well as moving to proficiency-based diplomas. And I feel changing the start time for the high schoolers in addition to making those other changes is stacking a lot on a lot on a lot. And I'm curious as to what the metrics are going to be for measuring the success of changing school start time when you're also making so many other changes. Um, I feel like option two if, uh, is a good compromise for my family and my specific situation. Um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brennan Favorite. I live on 1 Sarah Liberty Lane and I currently attend Scarborough Middle School. And I'd like to start out today by saying I feel like the middle schoolers have not been a group of mentioned kids during this meeting. Um, I'd like to also say that um, I am in support of changing the start times to later. Um, I know people are concerned that if people are still not going to go get enough sleep because they're just going to stay up later. but in my opinion, it's not so much academic reasons. It's because 99% of the kid population will have a screen in front of their face before they go to bed. Screens before beds have been linked to um, off sleep patterns and not as good as um, REM rapid eye movement sleep. Um, I would also like to say that um, more sleep will decrease the amount of student-linked accidents, and that's just one less person that's going to get hurt. So please change the start times. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kate Shaw. I live at 10 Val Terrace. I have a senior in high school and I have twins in sixth grade. Um, the other hat I wear is that I teach second grade in Old Orchard Beach. And Old Orchard Beach uh, went through two changes of start times for the high school. They um, did a slight change and then this year was a big change where the Jameson School started on the earlier time. So the high school was later earlier. And as the person that greets the second graders um, every day. I just want to share that my experience is that my students come ready every day. I have every level of academic um, ability. I have every level of parental support. Some of the kids get themselves ready. Um, buses start dropping off at 7.30. They play outside before school. They come in at 7.50. We start breakfast at 7.50 and um, academic time starts at 8.15. Um, I have a bigger chunk of academic time in the morning while my students are developmentally, or that's a developmentally appropriate time for them. Our afternoon isn't as long, and where before students, oh, they're, you know, until three o'clock, I've got all this time to go. Um, that's difficult. Now, there's a shorter time after lunch. I, I see more of a, hey, we can do this, and I have more from my students even after lunch compared to years before. So I have, I have great academic time in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, I'm the face that you see. I say good morning to everybody. They are bright and chipper, and I see no behavioral changes as far as, as that. So just speaking from the elementary point of view, it's been positive for us. I, I have not had one single complaint from a parent, not one. And um, anyway, that's my perspective. Good luck to you. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Corey Favorite. I live on 1 uh, Sarah Liberty Lane, and I am the fortunate father of a 13-year-old and a 7-year-old. So I see this play out at my house every day. Uh, my little guy is up and ready to go, no matter what the time is. Um, and uh, you can just see how easy it is for him and how much more natural it is. Uh, my 13-year-old, waking him up in the morning, it usually takes his mother and I at least three or four attempts. Um, and it isn't until we threaten him with his life um, where he actually um, gets out of bed um, and, and starts uh, down the stairs. He needs less sleep at night. He's not someone who wants to go to bed early. It just doesn't fit. And as far as the science go, goes, it's not about how much sleep you get. It's about, it's about when you get that sleep. So I would just encourage those folks that are um, you know, hung up on the number of hours. It isn't so much about that. It's about when you're, you sleep your best or when you sleep your, your deepest. Um, I also happen to be the director of neurosciences for um, one of the hospitals in town, and I work with one of the few pediatric sleep specialists. Um, he travels all over the country um, encouraging school districts, and uh, he's even testified in front of uh, Congress uh, on the science and, and moving start times for um, high school students closer to 8.30. Um, it's something that he's very passionate about. I almost talked him into coming tonight. Um, he's that passionate about it. Um, so I, I would really encourage um, the school board to go with the option that gets us closest to the 8.30 um, start time. Um, my wife and I schedule uh, an appointment on our calendars. We both work, and at 10 o'clock we get on the phone and we talk about what's the plan for the end of the day. Uh, and we go through where we need to be, swim practice, soccer. You know, We'll figure out, we'll figure out the logistics um, if the, the uh, start times uh, change. Um, but just to know that my son's got to get more sleep when he needs it the most, um, that's what's most important. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Last call. Anyone? Anyone? <coughs> okay. That is the end of public comment. Thank you. <coughs> so now we are moving on to item 6.0, superintendent's report. Um, tonight I just want to remind everyone of the official last day of school pending any other inclement weather is <laughs> June 21st. Um, so that is our official last day, given that we've had six snow days so far. We just want to make sure that we keep updating everyone and reminding folks of that date. Um, and then also, uh, during the first meeting of every month, I always give an enrollment update. And so our overall enrollment is exactly the same as it was um, last month at 2,986 students. Um, there have been some slight changes at each phase level. So. Um, at the high school saw a decline of two students, so we're at 988. Um, the middle school is exactly the same with the 718 students. We have three less students at Wentworth, so the uh, overall enrollment is 675. We've had three new students join us at Blue Point, so we're at 199 students. Eight Corners has one new student, um, but I think they have another new student today, 231. And we have one new student at Pleasant Hill, so we have 175 students at Pleasant Hill. And again, the overall enrollment is 2,986 students in the Scarborough Public Schools. And that concludes my superintendent's report. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, so 7.0, the chair's report. I'll keep mine very brief. Um, anything I would have to report ends up in a different committee report anyway, but I do want to take a minute to um, thank the members of the school board's families for giving up their families for the next several weeks. Um, we were at a town council meeting last night. We've already been in a meeting for five hours today before we got here at seven. And the list for the rest of the month doesn't look much different. We all said goodbye to our kids at seven this morning and won't see them again until tomorrow. Um, I'm sure they're not watching because it's a brief respite from having to talk about all of the stuff. So um, thank your families when you go home because it's a big deal. And that's the end of my report. <laughs> um, committee reports. Um, going to end with finance, or do you have a finance report? I don't have a finance report. I think Julie will probably cover most of it in, <laughs> in her report. Okay. So finance is done. Policy, Donna? So in policy, uh, this committee met and has been working closely with school leadership at the high school to develop a graduation policy. And the policy is changing since our incoming freshmen uh, who will graduate um, will be having to meet proficiency in specific areas. So 
What uh, policy committee has been doing is trying to develop the wording in that new policy to prepare our current eighth grade families for what their graduations or their incoming freshmen will look like. And we'll be prepared to bring that to you very soon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'd like to have that out so that we can make sure our parents all re recognize the differences that are going to occur for those incoming freshmen in the fall. The next policy meeting is next Monday at 3 o'clock in the superintendent's office. I did attend two more committees that I'd like to be able to share you with you. Um, one was the PEPG, which is the new implementation of the uh, professional growth model that all of our staff members have to have, along with their new evaluation program. So in this committee, um, we sat with a group of uh, the original builders of this plan who've been working on this for four years. Four years. So they sat at this annual meeting in order to discuss um, basically how to brainstorm some new ideas of how to make sure we bring on board all of our staff members because everybody will be evaluated differently and everyone will need to have a, a grow, personal growth plan as a part of this. So even though, um, even though we got our plan approved, written and approved by the state, it's now in its implementation stages and in that process, it takes time for our staff members to understand how to utilize this incredibly in-depth program. So, and you know we're following Marzano and we're <coughs> using a lot of technology around this, so it changes greatly um, what happens for teachers in terms of those two things, evaluation and professional growth. So, um, you know, the one thing that I feel like I really want to tell the board about this is that, you know, I recognized at that meeting that um, in a way it was easy in order to do the plan even though it took several years to write it. It's really difficult to implement it without teachers having the extra time to do the work when they're already so burdened with so many different things that they're working on already. So, you know, we're looking at, you know, what will those um, late start mornings be like on the calendar and you know if, if we're retur if we're not <coughs> giving the teachers enough time honestly i i really don't know where <coughs> the time can come from our elementary people are working on new curriculum and addressing the needs of kids our high school people are with me ask and all the work with uh, proficiency based education and the new diploma so i just feel the board needs to be aware that that need really continues for professional development. And finally, I attended the school business, business partnership that met this morning. There's a lot of excitement in this particular group. Um, it's led by Monique Culbertson as well as Karen Martin from the SEDCO office. And this group has broken into three different subgroups that are all working on a way in which we can connect our business people, local business people, with our school system. And I know we've always heard of career development, career education for years, and, and you know, there's been a variety of ways in which that's been implemented, but this is a totally new idea, uh, particularly since we're changing the pathways concept, that we're changing the way in which our high school kids will graduate, and thinking about the use of the term academies and pathways. And um, I think, you know, the real excitement here is that businesses in town seem to be really supportive of um, the concept of adding, as you've seen in the budget, the position of um, what used to be called the volunteer coordinator, but is really evolved into um, a partnership position that is currently in the budget that will be a key piece of what could happen for our high school kids if this if this were to fail in the in the budget for this coming fall it would be really unfortunate because I think 
um, there's tremendous support from our businesses as to what might be possible for our high school kids in working with them. And that position is not one that can be done by somebody who's just volunteering to do it. It's got to be a paid position. So I think you'll begin to hear from some business people in our meetings about support for that position. So thank you. That. Thank you. Anything from long range planning? Uh, well, we'll have something coming up at 11.7, all of the uh, applications to the Department of Education for um, financial support in school buildings. So we'll okay. hear about that later. Communications? Nothing new to report. In negotiations? Uh, we continue to negotiate the contract with the bus drivers and uh, we have had a subcommittee on uh, athletic stipends that has completed its work and as a representative to the Maine School Boards Association I will be attending a meeting in the morning uh, to talk about legislative issues and the bills that will be coming up before the legislature in the next couple of weeks. And just a note that is not connected to the school board exactly, next Tuesday the 11th at the Wentworth School starting I think it's 6.30. That got rescheduled. Pardon me? It got rescheduled. I got an email just tonight to April 25th to avoid oh. Passover. Okay. <coughs> Never mind. I was going to tell you about the trivia bee for the children. but. <laughs> I'll tell you that next week. <laughs> well, it will, will, that will happen before our next meeting. So it's April 25th at, um, I believe it's at Wentworth. It's the middle school trivia bee that um, Kiwanis sponsors and runs, and it's um, and Project, Project Grace. Grace. Yeah, it's a it's a co-sponsored event, and it's there are teams of middle schoolers that compete for a gigantic trophy. And I'm proud to say has lived in my house since last year. Um, it's a really fun event, so if you have some time, you should come. But it's rescheduled. Um, it's very breaking news, April 25th at the same time. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So that takes us to 9.0 oh. student representative reports. Do you want to go first? Uh, you can go first. Okay, I'll go first. So I'm just going to make sure that you all know that the middle school third annual junior trivia B <laughs> is on April 25th because that's the first thing I had written down. Um, and then also from the middle school, the Ultra Readathon um, is going on from March 31st to April 7th, which Saturday? Yeah, Saturday? Oh, tomorrow, Friday. Ooh, wow. Well. Um, and that raises money for field trips and for their team activities at the middle school. And I've heard that that's going pretty well. Um, at the high school, the juniors took their SATs yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, all the juniors had to take SATs yesterday. Those were rough. <laughs> um, and then the freshman class, sophomore class, and the senior class um, viewed the movie The Mask You Live In, which we talked about at a uh, prior school board meeting um, with the RSVP program and the Maine Boys to Men program. Um, and it was all about um, examining masculinity um, kind of in our culture and how that ties into mental health and also um, into domestic violence in our society. And then after that, um, the high school advisories uh, were split into groups of two or three advisory groups. Um, and they had activities kind of examining different stereotypes that we see in our culture um, and what we can do to kind of uh, go against those stereotypes and make it a more inclusive community for everyone. Um, and that went really well. I had a lot of people who said that they were kind of like, oh, why do we have to do this? And by the end of it, they were like, wow, that was really powerful and really important. And I'm glad that I was here to see that. So that was very successful. Um, tomorrow, April 7th, the Scarborough Athletic Council is holding a comedy night um, as a fundraiser. So you could come and support that I could not find the time on the website there's a flyer on the website so if you're interested in that you can go check that out on the Scarborough High School website. I believe it was 7 p.m. 7 p.m. Um, last week a group of six Scarborough High School students attended the Maine Youth Action Network Summit in Bangor which was a two-day summit that I was lucky enough to get to attend um, 
and students learned about topics that ranged from mental health to the main youth court system um, to an intersectionality and kind of examining that in our society. Um, at the summit, Ev Norsworthy, who is an SHS senior, presented on the topic of mental health in the LGBT community. Um, and Ev was also presented with the Maine Youth Action Network Independent Catalyst for Change Award for their work with GLSEN and for advocating for Maine students, which was really impressive and we were all very excited. <laughs> there were a lot of tears. Um, and last night, last night, there was a jazz night at the high school that was our jazz chorus and the jazz band. Um, that went really well and it was very impressive. And so that was great and everyone did a great job and that's all I have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, regarding Wentworth, um, the Community Garden Annual Bulb and Flower Sale is happening now between April 3rd and April 13th. Um, all of that was uh, started uh, because of the Wentworth Community Garden and so because of that they're going to distribute bulbs to people who want them for their own garden. Um, and uh, Wentworth will also be hosting a STEAM fair which promotes uh, science and math and engineering, all those kinds of STEM aspects, so allow for more people to enter those fields. And uh, the Jim Dandies will be having their community performance on April 8th. There will be juggling, unicycles, globe trotting, unihockey, all the stuff that I used to do when I was part of that, but stopped doing it. Um, so th that's going to be fun. Um, in terms of the times for that, that should be on the website. I don't have them off the top of my head, but there should be two shows. 2.30? 2 2.30. 2.30, yeah. 6.30. 6.30, yeah. We're a team. We are a team. We can all uh, uh, Now, if I was still doing Jim Dandies, I would remember that. <laughs> um, and... Uh, in terms of just another thing regarding the high school, so Academic Decathlon, I'd just like to bring up, is going to the national tournament um, in Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin, and that will be between uh, April 20th and April 24th. Um, as a member of the Academic Decathlon team, I'd just like to bring up that we are looking to help with funding um, <laughs> shameless plug, uh, <laughs> but for anyone who can, you know, contribute uh, on uh, youcaring.com, if you type in um, uh, Maine Academic Decathlon, uh, you will be able to find our site and contribute to that if you can. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Thomas, because that was one of the things I meant to bring up. So it's you caring, yeah. which is... Okay, you caring, Maine Academic Decathlon. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. And that takes us to 10.0 recognition. Um, so I would like to ask Michael Gage to come up to the podium for our recognition tonight. Uh, recently, I was informed of uh, an award that was given to or awarded to our athletes. Um, it's an award that we're very proud of. Um, of course, everyone knows that our athletic department is quite successful and very robust. We have um, a lot of students who participate in athletics, and we all know how important that is to their not only immediate academic success, but lifelong success. And so recently, um, Mike informed me that our athletes, or our athletic department was awarded the SMAA Sportsman Award. Our sportsmanship Award, and so I just wanted Mike to talk a little bit to us about that tonight. Well, thanks. It's a great opportunity, and it's a great award. And uh, most of you are familiar with the Maine Principals Association Award, the blue banners that hang in our gym when a team um, is voted on for a Sportsmanship Award, which is really around speaking about how they <laughs> Uh, perform during the season and they give out those sportsmanship banners um, each year uh, in, in each season in each sport that's voted on by athletic administrators as well as coaches this award that was given to us is really um, from our league it's voted on by student athletes and athletic administrators um, each year for the last 20 years the SMA has hosted a student athlete summit where each school brings 10 student leaders um, to a one-day workshop about leadership 
and during that workshop time those students vote on this sportsmanship award as well as the athletic administrators. The award is really for the entire department which makes it a little bit more unique than one of the MPA awards. Um, it's really saying that you're doing everything right as a department, you're really an exemplar um, not only for our coaches and our kids um, but how we run the department as well. So it's a great honor for Scarborough High School. It's a great honor for our department um, to be given this this recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Very impressive. Um, that's my only recognition for this evening. Great. That takes us to 11.0 to new business. 11.1. Um, Summer 2018 High School Spain Trip Proposal. So I'm going to ask our trip coordinator to come up, Brianna Kalman, who's going to speak a bit about the high school um, trip that's coming up soon. Hi, everyone. I'm Brianna Kalman. I teach Spanish at the high school. I'm here to talk briefly about a trip to Spain that I'm hoping to plan for the summer of 2018. Um, we just did a trip this summer, and I'm hoping to do something very similar. We took 15 students from the high school to Spain. Um, we traveled all over. This particular one is to, it's $3,400. Um, it's for students who have taken Spanish 3 and above, so for a minimum of three years of Spanish. We'll be going to Madrid, Barcelona, Sevilla, Granada, and Cordoba. Um, you have to have an 85 or above in the content area. And um, the cost does include everything, including um, round trip travel, breakfast, dinner, and all the entrances and fees to everything that we do. So it really is a good bang for your buck kind of trip. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really great opportunity for our students in the language program. Um, having done it before, I think it's immensely valuable, and I'm really excited to do it again. And the proposed dates are? It's in June. June 22nd. It's, uh, to around July. the 22nd. We won't know until about 60 days beforehand. Okay. So. Great. Yeah. Any, any questions about Spain? Anyone? If you need a chaperone, let me know. <laughs> Welcome to John. I've been on the list long. Besides <laughs> <laughs> more, it's first on the list. Yeah. Yeah. Then my Mr. Trump You have an 85 or above. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brianna, for coming and telling us about the trip. That takes us to 11.2, the June 2019 and June 2020 high school Europe trip proposals. Another trip that I will chaperone, um, and uh, Mr. Transolito is here to talk to us about that trip. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Steve Transolito. I'm a high school teacher here at Scarborough High School in the Social Studies Department, and uh, I'm just coming before you looking at uh, two proposed trips in 2019 and 2020. As you know, I was here uh, last fall to talk with you about 2018 for June, and that trip is in place, and we are on board to go to France and Italy. Uh, just real quickly, I know time is a, an element tonight, um, but 2019-2020, why, why planning ahead? Um, student travel seems to be accelerating across the country. More and more students are traveling across the United States, around the world. And EF Tours, the company we've worked with for a number of years, has been very successful. Um, they've been encouraging, and I've seen this even with students at Scarborough, that the more time that kids have to kind of plan for a trip, uh, financially it makes it more uh, cost effective for them gives them and their parents more time to fund it, and it just enables more students to travel. So what I'm looking ahead to is basically the current uh, freshman class, which is 2020, uh, and the current sophomore class, which would be 2019. So that would be their graduating years, but students can obviously participate in these trips when they're uh, underclassmen as well. So we're just looking ahead to look at a trip in those two years, and um, one other quick comment. Um, Brianna has done a really good job with the Spanish language program and uh, Helen Van Ness does an incredible job with the French program and obviously I've been doing student travel just to various parts of Europe with uh, students from across the high school. So moving ahead we're trying to coordinate trips that aren't in conflict with um, the other programs. We want to kind of grow student travel and I think um, from my experience being involved in this the more that students travel it creates more synergy for other kids to want to travel as well and I think the educational uh, outcome of that is really positive. So um, what I'm trying to do is work with Brianna and Helen to make sure that we're not planning trips that conflict with each other. So in other words, um, the trips in 2019 and 2020 would be to, to Britain, to the British Isles in 2019, uh, which is a place that we have not had trips to recently. And then 2020 would be to probably Northern Europe, uh, uh, Belgium, 
uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, and kind of Scandinavia. And that way we're not trying to run a trip that would be in conflict with, say, uh, a trip that's being planned simultaneously to Spain or to France. So we're trying to create trip opportunities for kids, uh, but at the same time encourage kids to travel, whether they're in the AP French program or Spanish or, uh, or traveling with, um, with um, uh, the program that I do uh, and with Blink and McIsaac. Or in some cases we have students who do travel through the uh, really cool Nicaragua service program um, through an area church here in Scarborough. So kids who, who are traveling, they come back, they tell other kids about it, they're really excited about it. Tom went on a trip two years ago to Greece with me. So uh, it's a win-win all the way around. Great. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions about those trips? Great. Thank you so right. much for coming tonight. Thank you for your time. Okay. That takes us to 11.3, the meeting minutes of March 2nd, 2017. Move approval is printed. Second. Any questions or concerns or corrections? Okay. All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. That takes us to 11.4, the first reading of the proposed <coughs> FY18 school budget. Good evening to round three of our budget rollout for the FY18 budget cycle. Um, just to bring the community up to speed, I'm Julie Kuchenberger, the superintendent, and this is our amazing business manager, Kate Bolton. We're going to be co-presenting today, um, and we have been talking budget for, I think, 24 hours straight now, officially. Um, last night was our uh, first reading with the town council. And so um, then today we spent from 1.30 to 6 o'clock with our entire leadership council who's still here tonight and uh, town councilor Chiazzo who's also still toughing it out with us um, and our entire school board. So we have been talking a lot about the budget and now I have the opportunity <coughs> to co-present it to you um, here in the first reading. And so for me, when I was first learning of the schedule, I could not really differentiate what I, was different about each of these meetings, given that this is my first time um, doing this in Scarborough. And I felt like very worried that I was going to be saying the same thing to the pretty similar audience. Um, but I think Kate and I came up with a plan that really allows us to, to tell the whole budget story in, in bite-sized chunks. So um, last night, if you missed it, you can go back and watch the town council presentation. I co-presented with our town manager, Tom Hall, and that was really like the what. So we talked just about like what is in the budget and really passing that over to the town council for their first reading so we could begin to dig into the budget and have some deeper conversations. And then today, um, I tried to talk less um, and let the leadership council really explain how the budget was going to drive our improvement here in Scarborough Public Schools for all of our students and staff. And so each of our um, principals and department leaders were able to really dig in deep with the, the school board and explain to them um, not only what we're planning for this year, but reflect a bit back on uh, the investments that we had made last year and how we're realizing the benefits of those investments. And so tonight, um, we're going to take another little angle at it and really dig into, like, why does this budget matter? Why is it important for um, you to support this budget as an uh, employee or as a student or a community member? Uh, so that's what Kate and I have planned for tonight. So um, the agenda looks a little like this. This generalizes some of the topics. And then we have some visuals that will support what Kate and I are going to talk about. We're just going to kind of go back and forth like a conversation. So our hope is that you leave here with a really deep understanding of what's unique about this budget, um, what's smart about this budget, but also what are some of the longer term investments that we're looking to make um, in years to come. Because we really look at this budget as a step closer towards um, the vision that we are all trying to realize. So um, there won't be any introductions, but uh, the work the work that we're doing is really changing, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going to talk about the current reality and what does it mean now that Scarborough, Scarborough um, looks to be an official minimum receiver. Um, we're going to then take a multi-year glance at 
what our school subsidy has looked like over time, our state subsidy over time, um, what is the valuation in Scarborough looks like over time, and then also the tax rate. We're going to have a little look at that so um, you can have sort of a long-range perspective as you're thinking about this budget. Um, and then we'll go talk a little bit about the, the proposal itself. Can we add anything to that? Um, I think the, the one thing that I would add, and I'll sort of cozy up here uh, to we the really microphone. Like no, we really We've spent way too much time together <laughs> lately. Um, <laughs> the one thing I would mention to the folks watching at home, the folks sitting in the audience, um, there is a budget document for the school department that runs to 114 pages that is posted on our website. Uh, there is a budget portal that is accessible from the school department website and the town website. And we function as a department of the town. Our budget is a <laughs> portion of the budget for the entire municipality. And so there's another document that's posted on the town website that is um, the town and school. And the school is a chapter of that book. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. There's, a, there's an enormous amount of detail in there. Um, it takes a great deal of work to put it together, both town and school. And the goal of that document is to give folks an insight into what the departments in the town do, including the school, why they do it, how they do it, and what resources they're asking for in the budget to accomplish that work. So I would strongly encourage folks to go out and take a look at that document. Um, we're going to sort of point to a few elements of it. We're going to talk about some of the big points that we think are important. But there's an enormous amount of material there so that anyone who's really interested in digging deeper um, should take advantage of that. And also on that portal, there's links to a few videos of previous presentations, one specifically about the um, collective bargaining agreement analysis that was done in the fall, one about just our process in general, which we're going to give you a little snapshot of tonight, um, and then the other presentations that, that, that we developed throughout will be included there. So it's really a great one-stop shop for all of your budget needs. Um, I like to start all of our conversations reminding <coughs> us of our mission. Um, this is our second time seeing it today as a school board and a leadership council. Um, but I really do believe that this is why we exist. And it's so critical that we keep this in the forefront of our minds so that um, as an organization, we're always striving towards this common mission. And when, when I read this mission to you, I want you to also be not only be thinking about the academic learning that happens in our schools, but also the social emotional learning um, that happens with our students. So um, we believe that the fundamental purpose of our schools is ensuring high levels of learning for each and every student. Therefore, we will do whatever it takes to bring all students to their full potential. So I wanted to start just talking a little bit about the current reality. And if you've ever read Peter Senge's Fifth Discipline, you understand the visual there. Um, one of the things that we're realizing as educators in, in, in our work is that we're being asked to do a lot of new and different things. Um, and there's a lot of pressures on the coming, to, coming at us and to us from a lot of different places in order for us to realize that mission that I just shared with you. And so partly what we want to do tonight is start off by really identifying, like, what is that current reality? Um, what, is the, what is the current status of our school systems? And how are we going to work towards that vision, that, that student-centered vision that we all keep at the forefront of our mind, and really that learner-centered vision as we think about what our staff needs um, along this journey of continual improvement. And so the idea here is that we're trying to keep just the right amount of tension between the current reality and that vision. Um, and if the vision starts to exceed at too much of a, a rate and our current reality isn't adjusting next to it, imagine that being a rubber band. We all know what would happen if you begin to stretch it too far. Um, but we also know if we set our goals too low and we underestimate the potential of our students and staff um, while keeping the current reality static, then that rubber band's going to get really kind of squishy and not stay taut and create that creative tension that we need. So I would say that we um, have a, a high level of creative tension at the moment. All of my educators in the audience, would you agree? Um, we're trying to do a lot for our students with a lot of external pressures squeezing in on that mission. And so um, Kate created this great diagram. I kept like swinging my arms around and saying this, and then she finally made a visual to support that. Um, in the middle there, it's really tiny, but that's our mission that I shared with you. 
So thinking about that high quality education that all of our students not only deserve but have a constitutional right to. And then what are the pressures that are squeezing in on that? Um, so at the top you have the continual reduction in state funding for education. I'm sure you've seen the articles in the paper um, and heard us talking about this, but we are realizing this year a, um, a massive reduction in our state subsidy, something that we knew was coming along the pike, but we didn't expect it to happen so rapidly. Um, so of course that, that puts some pressure on the work that we need to do and the continual improvement that we're trying to accomplish um, on a daily basis. So on the side then you have some pressures coming in from the rising fixed costs. Um, we have our collective bargaining agreements, which is a good thing. It allows us to recruit um, and retain highly skilled staff essential to our mission. Um, but then benefits are increasing, the cost of supplies are increasing, the level of services that students are requiring is increasing, and those costs are going up along with the cost of energy to keep our schools uh, warm and safe for our students and operating efficiently. And then we also realize this pressure coming up from the bottom, and these are like in no particular order, but um, the fact that the, this shift from the, the state funding, the, the reduced state funding to our local taxpayers, we're very aware um, of the capacity of our community to be able to continue to uh, contribute to this social responsibility called education. And we realize that we can't continue to go out to our taxpayers and ask them to fill these gaps. Some, for some of our taxpayers, they have the will and the means and they're able to do that. Um, but for some of our taxpayers, that's not their current reality. Uh, when you look at the demographics of our town, our 55 plus community is growing much faster than our school age community. Um, that doesn't change the needs of our school age community. It doesn't change the demands um, that we have as educators to make sure that they're getting the very best possible education that's gonna allow them to be successful. But we need to be aware of that pressure not only on us, um, but on our, on our taxpayers. And then of course there's you know, the, the unfunded mandates and the partially funded mandates that come to us or at us from the state. So proficiency-based education being one of them. Um, I'm happy to say that there are some state funds that support that work, um, but it's a teeny tiny you know, drop in the bucket comparative to the amount of professional development and personnel needs that it will require for us to do that work really well. And then um, other things like the evaluation system, PEPG, that um, Mrs. Beely was mentioning earlier, ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, we're still learning about what that impact might be. And then just the special education costs and 504 costs to make sure that all of our students are getting exactly the specialized education that they require. So if you imagine this kind of pressure coming in at all sides, that's what it feels like to be um, an educator today, <laughs> a little bit. <coughs> so Kate's going to talk a little bit about what, what's going on with our state subsidy and what's been happening over time. So this, this starts to sound a little bit like a, like a broken record. Um, state subsidy is the funding that the State Depart Department of Education delivers to local communities to support their K-12 education program. And uh, this slide is, is pretty telling. We've got a graphic coming up that uh, really shows it. Um, Scarborough State subsidy started out at $7 million in fiscal year 2009, and uh, so far this year it's shrunk by 49.2%. In this current year, 7.8% um, of the budget is being funded by the state. So if you, you know, want to talk colloquially, for every dollar that we spend, we get 7.8 cents from the state in support of that. Which again, as Julie mentioned, means that the local taxpayers are supporting our district uh, to an enormous extent and we're getting very little outside funding. In fiscal 18, we have a preliminary estimate from the state of Maine that says we're now going to get $2.1 million, which is another $1.4 million reduction from the current year. Um, and really, we don't have a lot of other options for funding in schools. Um, we have some miscellaneous revenues that we plug in, um, and we'll talk a little bit later about some of the other contributions that are certainly made by parents and community members to our school programs. But essentially, when state money goes away, 
then the local taxpayer is expected to pick up the difference because the costs don't really go away. And so what does that look like over time? Um, these two graphs give you a pretty strong visual. The graph on the left shows um, the state and federal funding here in Scarborough from FY9 to the current. And then the graph on the right shows the tax rate in Scarborough. Not hard to see how that funding has been shifted onto the backs of the local community. And, uh, you know, understandably, that creates great pressure, as we saw in an earlier slide, um, on our taxpayers to watch that increase year over year um, just to keep our schools running pretty much on an even keel with minimal um, new investment. And if we were to add uh, median household income, another chart here for you, you would see that it's a pretty, a pretty straight line with a steady decline um, happening. Again, you know, partially due to the, the way our, our demographics are shifting or, or growing, I should say, in town. So uh, there are two bases for the determination that the state makes on how much money to send to any individual community for their education programs. One of them is the state's version of the valuation of the town, the property values in a town. Um, it doesn't really have a relationship to the assessment that's done here in Scarborough where the assessor figures out the value of your property and sends you a tax bill. This is the main revenue services doing a valuation each year for each community in the state by their own parameters. Uh, but you can see on this chart, and this goes from fiscal 15 up to the, um, the coming year, that this is the, the, the point of this chart is that looking at us from the Department of Education's point of view, they figure that we're doing really well here in Scarborough, that our property values are going up, and that's <coughs> the measure of the prosperity of our community, and it's their measure of our ability to pay locally for the services that we're providing to our students. So there are two factors in the determination of how much money we get from the state. Valuation is a big one, and it's one of the ones that's been driving that decline over the, over the years that you saw in that prior chart. The other one is student population, and our student population has been experiencing um, either flat or a slight decline for the past few years. So the combination of those two in comparison with other districts around us has created that drop off in state funding. So it looks like we're land rich, but it doesn't take into fact, um, or property rich, but it doesn't take into fact our median household income at all. There's no income um, factor in their determination of our ability to pay, which is one of the, um, the complaints or, or um, dissatisfactions that people have with the way that that formula works because property isn't necessarily a liquid asset. Just because you own land that's worth something doesn't mean that you can write a check tomorrow. Right. And so um, these factors, these contributing factors that Kate mentioned, um, makes it official or almost official or anticipated to be official, I should say, that Scarborough will become a minimum receiver. And so we wanted to just take a few minutes to make sure that you all understood what that means to be a minimum receiver. Right, and we've been using that phrase for a couple of years now because we could sort of see the writing on the wall here. Again, we're being compared with all the other communities in the state of Maine in terms of that small pool of money that's available for K-12 education from the state level. Um, minimum receivership is the phrase that we use to describe the statute that says there's a minimum amount that the state can provide for K-12 public education in any community. So they go through this process of determining the value or the cost of education in each community. There's a complex <coughs> formula where they decide how much money we need to run our schools. And then they go through the process of deciding how much money we can come up with to pay for that. But at the bottom of that is a statute that says you really can't get less than this amount. And this amount is based on two calculations. It's the greater of the two. One calculation says it's a, um, a multiplication of your per pupil costs. And the other is a percentage of what you spent on special ed the last, in the last year that they're looking at. So they're looking at last year's expenditures from Scarborough. Um, in our case, our special ed costs were more than the calculation using the per pupil costs. 
So when you see that $2.1 million figure, that's what the state is telling us we're going to get next year, that represents 33% of our special ed costs in 2016, fiscal year 2016. So as someone who's new to the district and, and learning all about the main um, EPS formula in this system, what, what this translates to me is that you're getting a really big bang for your buck here in Scarborough. That um, the, um, the quality of education that you are getting for the, um, the, the cost per pupil comparative to other districts around us and um, both our comparable districts and our aspiration districts is, is a really good deal, if you will. So um, they have released preliminary subsidy calculations for the coming year. Um, that those came out last month. They won't be final until the legislature passes the budget in Augusta. And uh, the budget has a lot of controversial elements <coughs> to it. The education funding piece has a lot of controversial elements to it. Mm -hmm. um, what we're a little bit afraid of is that the legislature is not going to be able to come up with a, a vote and a final budget until long after we've had to pass our budget here in Scarborough. So what we're kind of counting on is that minimum receiver status. Um, if you look at this bullet, um, actually if you go through the calculations in the spreadsheet that says how much Scarborough should get, our subsidy allocation would only be $1.4 million. But because of the minimum receiver statute that says you can't have less than one of those two calculations, um, we'll, we would actually be receiving the $2.1 million based on our special ed costs, as I said earlier. Um, a lot of things are in motion right now in Augusta, but unless there is a move to add a lot of funding to the education pool overall, it's unlikely that Scarborough is going to get a lot more help from the state. Um, that could change a little bit, and we won't know for sure until probably after our budget is passed here. So this is kind of what we're counting on, and anything that we get beyond that is going to be uh, a happy surprise. Mm -hmm. So as Kate mentioned, this is um, something that the town of Scarborough has been talking about and knowing was coming eventually. I think for us, what we didn't plan on was that big drop in one year. And so um, we do have the ability to use fund balance as revenue at this point. And um, Kate has a handout for you that she's <coughs> going to share. Um, and this really comes from the Wentworth Project funds uh, that were used for debt service payment back in FY16, and then um, 2.2 million in unassigned balance funds that were available as of June 2016. Right. Um, and so this year we're looking at in our budget proposal uh, really relying heavy on that fund balance to, to offset that <coughs> revenue loss and using 2.1 million of our fund balance. Great. I'm, I'm going to set handouts here because I'm sure I don't want to work with everybody in this room with one before. Um, most of the stuff will be available online, but if you feel like picking things up as you go out, please feel free to do that. Um, yeah, this is a little bit of a complicated story. We've touched on it in a number of different meetings for a number of different reasons. Um, but we did uh, anticipate that we were not going to be able to receive a lot of state funding in this year. We kind of hoped, as Julie said, that it wouldn't crash quite so quickly, that we would have a couple of years to get to the minimum receiver status. Um, but because we had uh, a little bit of a windfall of Wentworth project funds left over from that project that needed to be used for debt service, we were able to generate a large surplus at the end of fiscal 16, which is now available to us to use as offsetting revenue in 2018. Uh, the sad thing, as Julie said, is that it's not quite enough to cover both the shortfall in uh, the mm -hmm. state funding and the not using Wentworth funds that we're using this year. That's okay. a terribly tortured <laughs> thing. <laughs> so, um, oh, did this not go in the right order? All right, let me just do something here. Where's that slide? Oh, where's that slide? Where's that slide? All right. Did we lose it? Bear with me one second. We need to refresh. <laughs> I'll do more handouts. We got a handout put the yin yang. Another technical term. That's an accounting term. So, um, 
as we try to put these slides in an order that builds the story for you, Kate and I were making some last-minute adjustments on Google Slides, so we just needed to update there. Um, this gives you a snapshot of really our budget process in front. And I have explained this a couple of times in a couple of different ways, but this is the first time we're showing it to you in dollars. Um, so briefly, I will start by just explaining the, the work that the Leadership Council has undergone since the beginning of December, really, um, to start looking at uh, this process and how we're going to get to the budget that's here in this proposal. So it really started with like a pre-budget phase um, that you don't see on here where we're looking really closely at our goals. Um, and the Leadership Council spent a lot of time reflecting on the investments that were made last year and the realities of what are happening in the school as a result of, in their schools and in their departments as a result of those investments. And that's a really important part of our work that doesn't just happen at budget time, it's an ongoing conversation that we're having um, to ensure that we're on track and we're on target and that where we invest we are actually seeing gains. Um, and so we started with that reflection piece and then we started looking at enrollment projections um, based on current enrollment and, and enrollment trends to say, you know, what are the class sizes that, that we're aiming for? How many staff are we going to need to accomplish that? And then how do we, what are the skills and attributes that we look for in all employees to ensure that we're recruiting and retaining um, and nurturing the very best possible staff that we can? Because when you look at the percentage of our budget that's devoted to personnel, it's 76% of our budget. So we felt that that was a really critical conversation to have K-12 and all of the principals and the central office leaders engaged in that dialogue really early on before we officially even started the budget process. Um, and then as, uh, as that conversation was happening, we were all also looking at what are the potential retirements, what are the potential vacancies, um, you know, who are the staff that we need to grow, and um, how are we going to do that? because that really leads into the, ne the first phase of the actual budget process, which is what we call level services. You could think of it as status quo. Um, I love what Kate says about closing the doors in June and just opening them up in August. Of course, even when you're looking at level services, there is a cost increase, because in level services, 76% of that is our personnel, and there's contractual agreements and contractual obligations um, that, we are, uh, that we are bound to uh, fulfilling. And so in this level services budget, we're really just saying, how do we, how do we maintain the current programs that we have? Um, but also in those conversations, we're meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Monique Culbertson, myself, and Kate sat down with um, each department to really find out what, how are you currently using your funds, how many funds have you used to date, um, and what are you projecting for the rest of the year, but then also in terms of needs for next year to just maintain those level services. And as a new superintendent, this was really um, an amazing opportunity for me uh, to spend some quality time with our leadership, uh, but to also hear kind of the internal thinking of our leaders and how they're prioritizing needs in their building, um, learn a little bit more about their staff and the work that they're doing in, in a different sort of context than possibly when I'm doing a site visit or at our, at our team meetings. So um, to me, that was such a gift in this process and such an important part of this process. And then from there, um, the next phase, which is the green column in the middle, the student-centered uh, phase. I like to think of this as the innovation phase. This is where I say to our leadership, think about your students' needs um, without boundaries. Um, and so these are real, this is a realistic kind of dreaming process where I'm asking them to think, you know, if we didn't have all of those pressures squeezing in on us, what would you really be looking for and asking for in this upcoming budget? And this is such, I think, an important part of the process to get out innovative ideas, but also for me, again, I'm listening to everybody. I'm processing all of their ideas and their proposals as they're presenting them to the whole leadership council um, in a K-12 way. And then together, we, we took those proposals and we sorted them. What are the high priorities? What are the mid priorities? And what are the low priorities? Um, and that, again, gives us a sense to kind of figure out what can we do within this budget. Um, and from there, after that part of the process occurred as a whole leadership council, you're talking about 21 people in a room really thinking hard about our students and our staff and what they need. Um, 
And then from there, there was more individual conversations where different principals or different department heads might be asked to go back and rethink, um, to look at existing resources and think about how could they realign or restructure some of their existing resources so that we had a better match between um, the strengths and the skills of the staff we currently have and the, the newness of the work or the changes in the work or the shifts in the work that needed to occur. So. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of the budget process because I think it really gives us a chance to, to stretch our thinking um, and challenge each other's thinking. From there, there's more work that happens in between, more meetings, more conversations about those proposals, um, about how we've sorted them in priorities, and then we're bringing together what we present to you, which is the mission critical budget. And so for me um, and for our leadership, this is oxygen. This is like what we absolutely need in this budget in order to ensure that we are continually improving. Because the reality is we don't have, our, ki we don't, our kids don't have time for us to not continually improve. And so we need to make inter incremental investments um, while also realigning and reassessing our current resources in order to ensure that we're always growing and improving. Can I add anything to that? No, oh, that was great. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> So that's kind of the, the snap, the, the whole budget process um, in a snapshot. And, um, you know, we're not expecting you necessarily to read these charts. We know that they're small, but we wanted you to have a visual so that when you go back to the budget portal and you're looking in the budget documents, some of these numbers and some of the things that we're pointing out will, um, will be making sense to you. Right. And in, in this one, you see um, three elements to the school budget. And in the municipal document, the school department is generally referred to as education as a whole. There are places where the budget's bro broken out and there's places where they're clumped together. So what we've got here is our general fund operating budget, which is K-12 education as we think of it. We also have the adult education program, the adult learning center, which is part of our budget. And we also have the school nutrition operating budget. And then another piece, which isn't reflected here, is um, the capital budget. So all of those pieces together form the education budget. Um, this is a, a place where things are sort of added together and um, represented in one spot because it compares nicely with some of the charts that are on the town side of the budget book. And so when we look at our budget as a whole, this pie chart kind of breaks out um, where the money goes, if you will. Again, I know that this is small, so I'll just kind of walk you through it. The big uh, blue part is personnel. That's the 76%, 76.1% of our budget. And then the darker um, slice, that's our debt service, which is 11.6% of our budget. Um, and then if you looked at the red slice there, uh, that's contracted services. And then the rest is supplies and, and tuition, um, operations, district professional development, energy and utilities. Um, so you can see that there's very little in the school budget that we have a lot of control over. Um, much of it are annual costs that will go up in incremental ways, um, but we don't have a ton of flexibility to be uh, super creative, if you will. Mm. You that? Um, I would just say that salaries, wages, and benefits, I think we heard a comment yesterday evening um, about teacher costs. Salaries, wages, and benefits that we form 76% of our budget are everybody who works for the district. So it's teachers, it's support staff, it's administrators, it's bus drivers, um, custodians. This is, this is basically a, a human-driven organization. It's a human business, mm -hmm. and um, as Julie said, there's not a lot of discretionary spending. There's not a lot of stuff in the budget. It's basically the people who are providing those services for our kids. So now we'll take a little closer look at level services um, and annual cost increases. <coughs> Remember this again is that first phase, that status quo phase of our budget. Um, and here you have the K-12 operating budget, last year approved to this year proposed, and also the debt service. Right, and these are the costs that are kind of, um, as, as the label says, fixed costs, annual cost increases. Again, we're kind of talking about a status quo situation so that, you know, we're, we're, we want to maintain, we want to continue the programs and the services that we're providing in the current year and carry them forward. Um, 
but that doesn't mean that we don't reflect on those things. It doesn't mean that we don't take a look. Mm -hmm. We don't simply say, well, this is what we had this year, so therefore we're going to have this next year, and then we're going to add some more things. We go line by line through every level services account. We sit with, as Julie said, we sit with each leader, each building um, principal, and each department head, and go line by line through each category of spending that they have and ask them to review with us what their needs are going to be for next year. So if you look at the 600 line item detail that's in the back of the budget book, which I'm sure you're all going to do as soon as you get home, <laughs> there you'll see some lines go up, some lines go down. Um, it's not just sort of status quo in the sense of we're not changing anything or we're not looking at it. Oh, well, here's a handout. So we have a handout for you. I'm not going to read all of the slides to you because you're going to have access to the handout. And again, this presentation and the entire budget book will be available online. But these are some of the major cost drivers um, to our level services budget. So again, this is with no new investments. This is just um, the, the commitments that we currently have and gives you a sense of some of the dollars associated with those things. Right. And as, as you see on the slide, um, since we've just been talking about the fact that personnel costs are the major costs in our budget, um, you can see that most of the bullets in this page and this slide are personnel costs. Um, the teacher salaries are, um, are created through a new collective bargaining agreement that we have this year, and, and there's a, a really interesting analysis presentation that's on uh, the budget portal website right now that Julie did earlier in the year that kind of talks about some of the impacts of that bargaining agreement. We've got two bargaining agreements that uh, Jack alluded to earlier that are under negotiation right now. Um, we have health insurance costs, uh, dental insurance costs, and workers' compensation costs that are um, attached to our existing employees and are, are currently being estimated. Um, one of our favorite subjects is the Maine PERS retirement system which was um, originally funded by the state of Maine, but along with many other things that they've decided local communities should take care of, they've shifted those costs down to um, the individual school departments. So we have an 18% increase in that requirement this year over last, and um, that just continues to be another cost shift onto local, uh, local communities. There's a couple of other things on there. Julie just said we're not going to read them, and I'm reading them yeah. to you. So, um, <laughs> but it, it is definitely personnel driven in most cases. It's good to have 30,000 foot view and details. Mm -hmm. Why we're a good team. Um, the one in the name of you know the the point of tonight's presentation, the why behind this. Um, you know, I'm so proud of the, the collective bargaining agreement that we have with our teachers and our employees. I think that it's really, really important for us to have competitive, competitive salaries for our staff. Um, just to put a little bit into context, and this is in that presentation that Kate was referencing, um, we have a very experienced staff. Uh, approximately 12.6% of our staff um, is ready to retire or of age and years of experience and could retire, I shouldn't say is ready to, um, tomorrow. They could retire tomorrow, 12.6% of our staff, that's significant. We have several staff members with 30 plus years experience um, in the classroom on our leadership team. And so, you know, they have lots of choices and options and we're thankful that they're staying with us. Um, but we also have another like 5.4% of our staff that will be ready to retire or of age and experience and able to retire within the next five years. That's a huge gap. And when you look at state, the state of Maine in and of itself, um, I think they're predicting 18% of teachers in Maine are going to retire in the next five years. So um, I'm feeling a, a bit of concern about the talent pool in the pipeline into education, particularly when you look at the federal data. Um, it's really mind-blowing. Typically, like if you look starting back even into the 70s, um, into the early 90s, into the into like 2010, right up until next year, we were always around like 11, 12 percent of college gra um, or high school graduates were going into education fields. 11 to 12 percent of all high school graduates, right, that are going on to college. And of those students that would go into the education major, I should say, uh, 30 percent of them n never make it into a classroom. 
And so now just some quick math, you see where we get. Um, and of those that do make it into a classroom, another 30% typically last about five to seven years in the field, and then they choose to leave and do other things. Um, so the talent pool is already pretty limited. What's concerning to me, in 2016, that number dropped to the lowest it's been in 45 years with only 4% of high school graduates going into education majors. So this is, these, this is federal data. Um, so as we start to recruit new talent um, to, fill our, to fill the void of our experienced teachers' retirements, we're going to be casting nets wide and far, but we really need to make sure that we have competitive <coughs> salaries. And this is something that long before, you know, um, I came to the district, the district has recognized and has been working on. And I think through two contract negotiations now, um, the school board has been really working on trying to close the gap and make our salaries more competitive with some of our neighboring communities. And so this contract, what you're realizing in this contract and this budget, we make a big step towards that, but we're still not even in the middle. We're still on the low end when you start to compare to other districts. Um, and contracts are a tricky thing. Salaries are a tricky thing to compare because there's lots of other factors that go into it. Um, so I say these things in a really general way, but um, there's a, a deeper analysis that has been done and is available on our website as well that looks at all of these sort of factors. Uh, um, and so I think that's something really important for the community to keep in mind as you're, as you're looking at that big piece of our budget, that 76%. Okay, so one of the problems or challenges with presenting a budget in the beginning of April is that there are lots of things about our projections for next year that we really don't have great data on. Um, under charter and under statute, we have to go through a political process to get our budget through the various stages of approval and out to the voters. And so we have to get something out there to talk about, but in some cases there's some pretty wild estimating going on. Um, we're pretty good at it because we've been doing it for a long time, uh, but there are some things right now that we can tell you that we don't know the answers to, and we won't really know those answers until we get further into the process. So the difference between the first reading that we're doing tonight, we're going to ask the board to pass this budget in a first reading, and the second reading, which they'll be doing at the end of this month, um, it can be significant depending on these outside factors that will come in for us. So as we look at the budget overview, there are other funds that are also important to notice. Um, school capital budget, adult education, and school nutrition. Um, again, I keep referring you to the budget document because there's a ton of interesting information in there, but these are all separate elements of the education budget that will be reviewed by the finance committees and the, and the various uh, the boards and the council. Um, they are considered to be separate funds, but they are managed by the school department and they're part of what we have um, as our planning process for the next year. So again, not something I expect you to read from your seat, but this is, I think, the part that makes the budget the most interesting um, and is really a testament to uh, the hard work of our leadership council. This uh, green sheet that, that Kate does have a, a pretty handout for you, this shows the realignment of resources. So rather than asking for new investments to accomplish some of our goals and to meet the needs of some of the shifting work that's before us, our leadership has really um, thought deeply about uh, the different resources that we currently have and how we could reallocate or realign those funds. And so this, is, this comes to a total currently, again, some of this still in motion, $620,000 um, that or, or seven and a half full-time equivalents that our staff has either um, realigned or, or repurposed within the existing resources without um, you know, increasing the bottom line, so to speak. And so when we get to our targeted invest investments for continual improvement, this again is the, the oxygen. This is what we talk about when we're talking about our mission, mission critical budget. Um, this is where our staff is looking to uh, bring back uh, a K-2 principal. So you may know that uh, a few years ago we used to have a principal in each building um, and then for uh, a short while we thought maybe we were going to have to close a school and so we have one principal and an assistant principal that have been managing two buildings um, on two opposite ends of our 55 square 
mile town, which has posed a challenge for the staff and for families. And um, sadly, our assistant principal, Ann Cass, who's here with us tonight, uh, is planning to retire and go on to bigger and greater adventures. Um, and so at that, I think at the moment I met Ann, she started asking me about what the plan was going to be to bring back this other principal. And I kept saying to her that, you know, this is, we're not just solving the K-2 issue. This is a, we need to look at the whole system. We need to make sure we're solving the right problem. Um, so patiently, she let me learn um, and ask a lot of questions, and we came to this solution, which I think is uh, brilliant, if I do say so. Um, we are going to, we're proposing to bring back that K-2 principal, whose primary job will be to be the principal of the Pleasant Hill School, because it doesn't really matter if you have 175 kids or 200 kids, a school needs a principal. Students don't wait to have a crisis. Students can't plan for you to be there for them to need you. They need their leaders and so do staff. And so um, this is something I believe in very passionately and I'm excited to have in this budget proposal. But then we also are realizing this need um, with the shifting roles and responsibilities of our educators, of our principals, um, we're realizing that there's a bit of a gap where we're struggling to support our staff the way they, needed to, they need to be supported uh, to do this big work that's ahead of us as we work to prepare our students for a rapidly, rapidly changing world. And again, remember how experienced our staff are. They come with a lot of tools and a lot of skills, and we're asking them to do a lot really differently. Um, and that takes time, and that takes professional development and support. And so this other, this other responsibility of the K-2 principal will be to be um, what we're calling an improvement strategist. And the primary focus of this improvement strategist role will be to create some co to increase the cohesion across our three K-2 schools. Um, our principals, our K-2 principals already have a mantra of three buildings, one school, um, and it's becoming challenging under the current leadership structure for them to really um, take that vision and make it as much of a reality as I know they want it to be given their high expectations. So we're really excited about the potential of this position and this idea. And that carries through to the middle school and the high school, that improvement strategist position. So the high school already this year um, had the amazing fortune of having a director of teaching and learning who was a, um, a consultant that we brought in Catherine Ruby um, is her name, and she has proven to be an amazing asset to the high school, um, to the leadership, and to the staff. And so as we went through and we prioritized, or we looked at what our priorities were of our proposals, this emerged to be priority number one at the high school. Um, so you see that position here as an additional FTE because in the current year we were funding it through grant monies that will no longer be available as we go into the next year. So .7 of, of her position is um, in this budget, and then point three is coming from reallocations. Um, also, another position that we're really excited about in these new investments at the high school is a uh, career and education coordinator. So as Mrs. Bealey was speaking earlier about the excitement and the um, momentum and the community business partnerships, we believe this person to be, or this job, this position, to be a critical focal point that will allow us to begin to think creatively about what education looks like, um, what kind of experiences we can create for our students in high school, um, but also in the middle school and in our elementary schools. And um, we're really, we have three big goals for this position, um, and it's uh, goal number one is to build and um, nurture those relationships with our community business partners. Uh, we're looking at how can we uh, develop those partnerships and begin to creatively fund some of our educational needs as we shift to our brand new or to our um, new graduation requirements and to the proficiency-based education model um, and allowing us to also bring in um, some new options for students like career academies, like internships, like workplace experience and job shadow. And um, all of those things are really great for kids and everybody knows that they are, but it takes a lot of coordination and a lot of skill for someone to be able to nurture those relationships and support those students when they're out in the field um, and as we're creating this, these new ideas at the high school. So we believe that that is also a really critical position. Um, as in special services, what you see on here is that we are um, requesting a 612 behavior specialist and a .6 occupational therapist. Again, just supporting the increasing needs of our students um, and, and the way that their needs are changing. Um, 
and Allison spoke a lot about this today, so I won't repeat exactly what she was saying, but that's another new investment for us. And in our athletic department, you heard uh, Mr. Legage talk about how robust that athletic, our athletics department is and our extracurricular activities. And so what we're asking for in this budget is additional support in a .5 athletic trainer that will allow us to better support our students' um, physical needs as they participate in athletics and also um, a point five business secretary to just help manage some of the clerical tasks that come along with um, having such a robust athletic and extracurricular program. The, um, <clears throat> the part of this mission critical budget that I think I'm, I don't want to say most because I'm excited about all of it, but um, that I think is really creative and innovative is the work that the middle school is doing and looking at existing resources and realigning some of the resources that already exist within the school without asking for any additional positions and in fact um, giving up point two of an FTE so that we could meet some priorities at other phase levels. And what it allows us to do is um, bring in a library media specialist. The middle school, I've learned, has <coughs> never had a full-time media specialist, 715 kids. Um, and so this person is going to be critical in helping our students navigate this knowledge economy and working with our staff and our students to truly become digital citizens um, and use our one-to-one -one devices to their full potential, but also you know, keep on the transformation of our libraries to more of a learning commons. So moving away from a place you go um, to get information and more a place you go to create information. So we're really excited about that. And that, six, um, that improvement strategist position is also a need at the middle school with 715 students and a lot of staff that are working really hard and need support. And so um, we're requesting to have that position at this phase level as well. And what you <coughs> might be wondering is why don't we have an improvement strategist for Wentworth? Why isn't that in the proposal? And that is exactly what we were hoping you would ask. And so um, it's definitely something that we need, uh, a support that we need at Wentworth as well. Uh, Kelly Crosby and John Thurlow have done an amazing job of opening that building, implementing new curriculum, supporting staff and students as they transition. Um, and they, it's a big building to do with just two, two official leaders. And so um, the only reason why it's not here in this budget is because we're predicting that next year we might be able to have some realignment and cost savings there. And so we plan to ask for it um, in our next budget cycle. So just planting that seed so that you know. Um, and if you have any creative ideas about how we can make that happen this year, we're, we're ready to listen. I think this might be a good moment to mention in, in one of our earlier meetings, um, it was brought up that the, the price tags that are put on these new positions might be confusing to folks. Mm -hmm. Um, we figure out when we, when we talk about a new position that doesn't exist yet or that's being re-envisioned re from something else, we, we figure out a median salary, but then we also have to calculate the benefits that go along with that. So we have to estimate what kind of health insurance that person might take. We have to calculate the main PERS and the work comp and all those things that we were talking about earlier that factor into personnel costs. So. Um, we don't really necessarily want folks to take a look at a $75,000 price tag on a, a single position and say that's the salary that that person is going to receive. That's our guess as to what the whole package of a person might cost us. Good. And it is an estimate. Thank you for clarifying that. And um, the other thing I would add is all of this innovation, all of this creation um, and creativity here from our leadership council equates to a total amount of $296,000 in new investments. So when I think about the potential of, of these positions and of this work, um, it's 0.6 of our overall budget, less, almost a half percent of our overall budget. So I think that the potential for the return on this investment is really great. So as we um, bring this conversation to a close, I just want to share with you some of the ways that we are already seeking creative funding sources, but I also want to let you know that this is at the forefront of our minds as we think back to the pressures and we think of the pressures also that are on our local taxpayers. 
Um, and I just wonder if our community knows how much our families currently contribute. And um, this is something that I'm dying to actually calculate, but it's kind of a moving target. Um, but for our families, you know what you pay for activity fees, for clubs, <coughs> for parking, um, for laptop maintenance, for field trips, and fundraisers. So I think if we could quantify that, that would be a really good data point to share with our community to show that you're already offsetting the bottom line through your contributions in the services that you're seeking in our schools. Um, and then, of course, the community support. We're so fortunate in Scarborough to have a Scarborough Education Foundation that funds innovation grants for our teachers. I'm super excited about the most recent grant cycle. I can't wait to see um, what SEF is able to support because there's some really <coughs> interesting ideas across all of our phase levels, um, inc including uh, some district-wide initiatives to bring Project Lead the Way and other STEM initiatives uh, into our schools. We also have a Feinberg Trust that supports our, art, our arts, our fine arts program, um, and also supports SES. So that's a, a, another aspect of creative funding. And then, of course, the school business partnership. I feel like that's a potential we haven't quite um, fully realized yet, but there's some really exciting conversations going on. Um, and I'm learning how to, to think more like a, a business person. <laughs> Than, than, an, than an educator as I, I work to grow my skills in that area as your superintendent. And like I said, the fundraisers, the, the local grants and donations, and of course, volunteer hours. That's always a tricky one to calculate, but I heard tonight about how you know, several of our parents mentioned being in the schools every week, once a week. That's pretty amazing support for our schools. So um, I hope that this presentation was informative. I'm sure you may have lots of questions. I encourage you to stay engaged in the process. Our budget forum is coming up on April 26th. 20, 26. 26. April 26th, and that'll be at Wentworth School. It's open to everybody. You can submit questions ahead of time online. Um, and so I encourage you to do that. We answer every single question. And then if you come and you have more questions, we'll answer those too. Um, and then we also have the actual budget validation vote, which happens in June. And uh, Jody, could you remind us of the date for the vote? June 13th. June 13th. And that'll happen at Scarborough High School. You have 12 hours to come out and vote from 8 to 8. So um, I hope that you take advantage of those opportunities and tuning into the town council and joint, or the school board joint finance committee meetings as we, as we work through the process. Absolutely, and uh, again, I keep I feel like I keep plugging the website. Um, all these people who are sitting here in the room, I appreciate the fact that you're not sitting at home looking at the website, you're actually listening to it. <laughs> but uh, we do have on the school website and on the town mm -hmm. side, we've got a sort of a calendar of the various budget process pieces that are going to be happening for the next six or eight weeks. And um, we totally welcome community involvement in those. Um, most of those meetings are, are open to the public and, and public <coughs> Uh, certainly welcome there. So are there any questions from the school board regarding this? No. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at the clock. Um, we have a policy that's enforced that we can't take up new business after 930. So we are moving at lightning speed now. Motion, okay. please. So I have two movements. Um, I move approval to adopt the Leadership Council's budget proposal as presented for first reading. Total general fund operating budget is proposed at 48,128,940 with offsetting non-tax revenues of 4,788,151 and a tax request to the town of $43,340,789. Second. I, do we want to do both at the same time? Yes. All right. I also move approval to adopt the capital, invest, uh, capital improvements, adult education, school nutrition budgets as presented for first reading. Second. Okay. So we just had a really long meeting uh, talking about the budget, but if anyone has any general comments or questions right now. I'll shoot him. I <laughs> <laughs> might shoot you. I would, just, I would just make a general comment that this is an amazing budget for the situation that we're in, for the state funding and the pressures that we are experiencing. Um, and it's a remarkable um, budget put together by the leadership council and the superintendent, especially for our first time out of the gate. Very <coughs> impressive. Um, anything else? Okay. All in favor of accepting this budget as the first reading and the capital improvement? 
7 plus 1. Thank you. Plus, plus two? Yeah. Very late. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Why don't you <laughs> yeah. I got you. Okay. Right there. okay. Which takes us to, um, well, just one point of order. If we are going to, in the past, in my memory, we have voted to extend the time to 10 o'clock. Anybody else remember that? Yes. Anyone else's tenure? Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's do that right now so we don't have to interrupt the conversation. So I move that we um, suspend policy BE that says we cannot take new business after 9.30 and extend it to 10 o'clock. Second. Any conversation about that? You sure you want to put a limit on it? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I think it was, we only added a half an hour last time. If you want to give it to 10.30, sure. I'm <laughs> open to that. I don't want to give it to 10.30. I'm yeah. simply saying we don't want to make it. one motion and continue it. <laughs> Seriously. Be realistic. I think 10. I think we can do it. Uh, Appointments is going to go fast. I think we can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So. All in favor. Okay. What? Yeah. May I make one request? Is there any chance that... Todd, if we don't approve those DOE, oh yeah, um, no, they, I think they have to be approved tonight. They have, Michael, to, be. They they have to be approved tonight, or we can't oh. put them in. So, oh, so if get moving, can we? Either we need an amendment for 10:30. I uh, request that we amend the extension until 10:30 p.m. if necessary. Okay. okay. All in, okay. All in favor of the amendment? Okay. Amended to 10:30. All in favor of 10:30 extension? Students, you can leave because it's a school night if you need to. No, so just get up and walk I'm out. driving him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man. I don't give time we have to call an Uber. <laughs> okay. We'll be so quick. All right. So, um, 11.4, first reading the proposed FY18 um, school calendar. I move approval of um, calendar option number three for the first reading. Uh, for the 2017-2018 school year. <coughs> okay, discussion? Um, I just first want to say I appreciate everyone coming out and, shared um, and, and speaking. We know it's not always easy to get up and, and have to do that in front of everyone. So we appreciate that and we think your engagement is important. And um, thank you for hanging in, in there with us tonight. We have all done a lot of research on this issue over the last 18 months, and I'm convinced that the calendar option number three is the right option for Scarborough at this point. We, as a board, have gathered um, a lot of information and should be making a decision based on facts and experience and research for all of our students, which is all 3,000 of them. Our job is to serve the best interests of those students. And I understand some of you won't agree with me. I get that. Um, and that's your right. And I hope that we can all be respectful that everyone has different opinions and circumstances. Um, what you feel passionately about one way, there's somebody else out there that feels passionately about it a different way. And um, we understand that it's going to be a big change for, for families and potentially a tough change for some. We also understand that this is a welcome change for some families. Again, it is our job to listen to all sides, ask questions, do the research, um, and come up with a balance that meets the goals. I have learned that sometimes doing what is right is uncomfortable, sort of like this. Um, the board has spent countless hours researching, discussing, looking at options, rehashing, talking to other communities. And I think um, I have come to a point that the right thing to do is to make this proposed change. I also think that it's important for all of us to remain open-minded that this board and our leadership will continue to look for efficiencies in transportation and schedules. Um, many of you have emailed your thoughts and some in strong favor of the change while others are against it. Uh, we have heard you. We read every word, every email we have read. Um, a lot came in today. We might not have got back to you yet, but we have read them. Um, there have been emails that talk about the fact that we may be harming the younger children. I think it's important um, to remember that we serve on this board for all of our students. None of us join this board for the glory or the money. Uh, we feel very passionately about education and about the students of Scarborough. So 
we are dedicated to making the choice that we feel is best. And um, I'll stop there so everyone else can discuss. I reserve the right to come back. Anyone else? I have a serious opinion, but I would like to hear from our students first. Um, <laughs> Tom, yeah. you can go. So um, over the past two weeks, uh, I've heard a lot of very passionate people talk about, you know, the uh, especially option three and the implications it would have. And every single one, every single one was against the change. I had not one person say to me that I want start times to go, you know, to 8.30 or 8 or whatever. Um, and I think that that really says a lot about the situation, in at least the high school, that, you know, there may be a lot of people that um, want, you know, start times to be later, but they're not being at least vocal enough to me to uh, really seem to have as strong of an opinion as the people opposed to it. At least that's how I take it. Personally, I don't have much of a strong opinion, but uh, either way, but I've heard a lot more against it than for it. Um, I also, like Thomas, have talked to a lot of people who have some very strong opinions about it. Um, but actually, a lot of the people I talked to, though they weren't in favor of starting it, the option three, 8.50, late start time at the high school, were in favor of it being later, potentially at an eight o'clock start time, which I think is the option <coughs> two option. Um, so I think there are students at the high school, at least that I have talked to, who would be comfortable with that change <coughs> and who are supportive of a change being made. Um, but I am also the sort of person who was like, all right, but I'm going to send you all the links to this research that you should read. So there you go. Um, so maybe that was me. But um, so I think either way it goes, there are going to be people who are really, you know, positive about it and who will see that it could have a positive impact on people. Um, but there's also, there's always going to be people who are upset by it and who it will have a negative impact on. So I think at this point, I personally believe that our best option is to, you know, just do what we can to support the people who it will have an impact on that maybe isn't the easiest for them um, and try to make the change and make that process easier for them. Um, but personally, I think that, you know, the research doesn't lie. and there's something's got to change because, yeah, research doesn't lie. So that's what I've got. Thank you. And uh, oh, okay. sorry, I'd just like to add one more thing. Is that uh, one of the things that m most of the things that people talk talk to me about was mentioned here, except for one major thing. It's um, about how. Um, after people eat lunch because of digestion, because of regular cycles, they're going to be tired around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, no matter what. So changing start times won't affect how people feel groggy then. But I don't know, that's going to be a problem no matter what. So. Sorry, I just remembered another uh, thing that I had made a note about um, when the community members were coming up and talking. Um, no one seemed to really be talking about the mental health implications of it um, and how, you know, um, I think we had one community member who talked about um, it's not the quantity of the hours of sleep you're getting, it's the quality of the sleep that you're getting um, and how, you know, having students who are having a sleep pattern at this point that is off of what it should be naturally um, isn't a, having a positive impact on their mental health and is leading to different mental health issues and 
So I just thought that was something that wasn't brought up either that people should take into account. Thank you. Jackie? If we had all of our children, all of our students start school and end school at the same time, we would need 15 more buses. We can't afford it. And even if we could afford the buses, we're having a very difficult time hiring bus drivers. We're already short three, I believe. But right from the beginning, I have been skeptical about the youngest children in our community starting school at a time when they would have to be out so early. And I've made that very <coughs> clear to my fellow board people from the very beginning and the superintendent, and, and I will not support the present uh, motion. I can support two. And I think that is, is the fairest way to deal with, with the situation at the present time until we can hire uh, more bus drivers and purchase more buses. Um, this issue is really near and dear to my heart. It marked the very beginning of my time on the school board. My first school board activity was October 2015. I hadn't even been elected, but I was running unopposed, so they invited me to a regional meeting on, um, hosted by Start School later in Saco. So this was, it, and it was shocking, it was really enlightening to me, the research and seeing um, how it almost feels like malpractice to be sending our high school students school at 7.35 when we know what we know now. It feels, uh, I don't see how we can in good conscience not change that. Um, the, the, some of the concerns that we heard about the high school kids, about how they'll just go to sleep later, um, about how it's not going to make a difference, um, they won't be able to do activities. The science and the research don't bear out any of those conclusions. The science shows that they will get, in fact, get more sleep. Um, I think the one of the um, things is that it, waking uh, an adolescent student up at 7 o'clock is the equivalent of waking one of us up at 4 a.m. That's how deep they are. They should be sleeping at that point. Uh, and to interrupt that day after day, maybe not on late start Wednesdays, but that's not enough to make up for it, day after day, it has a cumulative effect that can lead to all sorts of terrible outcomes for them. And you can easily find that information out there. Um, so I won't keep talking about that right now. Um, I'll go to the K-2 kids. Um, I've thought since being in the school district that it seemed the wrong order to be sending kids to school in, and um, not just because of my own children, but also because I have a degree in el elementary education. I've taught first grade. I've taught third grade. My, I have teachers in my family. It's a real passion of mine, elementary education. Um, and I would never do anything. I would never place a vote that I felt like was going to be harmful to them. Um, I think that developmentally we're doing this wrong right now, and I think that the K-2 kids really ought to be going to school before the high school kids do. Um, I wanted to point out the average start time for elementary schools in Maine is 8.20. We are at the very later end of that. Um, I also was talking to a teacher who's been teaching in Scarborough for a long time at the K-2 level, and she said that when she started in Scarborough, the start time was 8.15. It hasn't changed because there was a scientific uh, discovery that 9 o'clock was advantageous for them. It happened because of busing and transportation, and because maybe we went from two bus runs to three bus runs. It happened by happenstance that we're in the place that we are right now. Um, and I, I appreciate everybody who came up and spoke um, like Jody said, I know that you are strong school supporters. I know that um, you believe in what we're doing in the schools, and I really appreciate that and your advocacy and your passion for your kids. Um, I advocate for my own kids, and I really appreciate you advocating for yours, too. Um, one thing about the current proposal that bothers me a little bit is having Wentworth and K2 at the exact same time. So I think it's not logistically it doesn't make logistical sense to have them start and end at the exact same time for parents who ha might have kids in both places. 
so they need to pick their kids up. They can't be in two places at once. If we can find any wiggle room um, through bus audit or further talk with our transportation director, I would strongly support pushing the K2 times back to 8.10, 8.15, um, get those kids a little bit of extra sleep in the morning, um, and uh, also make it just make more sense for those families. Um, I think that the concern about kids being out in the dark, um, I've done the research on it. It's the sunrise in Portland, Maine, <laughs> um, from December 5th to January 29th, it is when it happens after 7 a.m. The latest it ever comes up is 7.14 a.m. Um, I don't think we're going to have little kids out in the dark. I don't think that many kids get on the bus a full hour before their school start time currently. Uh, so I, don't, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer to say that our, early, our youngest kids are going to be, have to be up, fed, dressed, ready to go at 7 a.m., even if our bus runs start then. Um, I think 7.30 is probably a lot more accurate, and that's if we can't find the wiggle room. If we can find the wiggle room, it's going to look more like 7.45 for 90% of our kids. Um, so I think that that is not such a unreasonable time, even for those kiddos who, do, who are at the higher end of needing that um, 9 to 12 hours of sleep. Um, and if we look at the average of that, it's very reasonable um, at 10 and a half hours or so. so um, to the point about that, it, that um, teaching them at the optimal learning time, that block in the morning from my time in elementary education is gold. You want that morning time for those little kids. That's when they're ready to engage. That's when they're focused. After lunch, just their circadian <coughs> rhythm looks a lot like adults. After lunch, they get a little bit groggy, <laughs> and that's true for us as well. Um, so I think that if we can maximize that morning time, for those littlest kiddos that um, we're actually going to be doing them a service. Um, so I think that that is about all I have to say. And um, thanks again for everybody who came out and spoke. And I'm certainly not going to sit here and repeat everything that everyone else has said. Um, just speaking on my own part, I have two kids, and I know that my kids were always up early, mostly. Um, one's easier to get along than the other, as in a lot of families, everybody has two different kids, they have different personalities, they have different things that make them tick. Um, but I see, I, I think that when the survey went out, and I even answered the survey myself, um, I said it would have no impact on me, because that's the way I feel. I can drop her off at 9, I can drop her off at 7.15. It really and so I think then when some of the results came back, people were saying, well, it has no impact, so that means nothing. But I don't think it was interpreted in that way. Or what I said when I typed that didn't, isn't what I meant, that it didn't make a difference to people. So anyway, um, I'm in favor of the option three. Um, like Carrie said, if there was a way to fix that K235 piece, that would be helpful. We have bus issues. We have a lot of square um, miles in this town um, without a lot of extra money, as uh, has been pointed out, and a lot of extra buses. There's not really a way to make every student start at the same time. So that being said, I think that at this point, these are our best options. We're not trying to be trendsetters or um, break the milestone here because a lot of districts have come before us. So when people were getting up and saying those kinds of things, I think maybe they didn't realize that Old Orchard has made a change twice, and Biddeford has changed, and all of these other districts. So it's not like we're saying, hey, we want to be at the forefront of this. We are not. We have spent a lot of time, maybe more time than a lot of other districts have. And so I think we have been extremely thoughtful, and I appreciate everybody that wrote. We all did read all of the emails. Um, we do have just Kelly or Carrie that answer them um, as the communications chair and as the board chair. So um, don't think that we all didn't read everybody's every word and some people who wrote more than once. So we, we did read them all. Um, thanks for coming out. And I am willing to support number three and hope that we can fix that one little piece. Um, I, I, I again want to thank everybody for coming out because I know it's not easy to 
speak about things, you know, to the board. And so I appreciate. Oh, I appreciate that. And um, and I just want to reiterate what you said about it not being a new thing. Like I was reading about it as well, and it said over what I read the uh, statistic was over um, 300 districts in over 44 states have, are also in the process of already made the change or going to make the change, and all over the country. Um, and then I am in favor of um, option three, but I do understand the, you know, hearing parents talk about time with their kids, and I think all of us who are parents value that time with our children and and want everyone to have that time to be with their children um, and have that quality time. So, and so I guess I, guess I am in, in hopes that we can tweak it, and I know from my experience when my kids were in the K-2 schools, I know the bus runs were not as long as I know what we're, you know, putting on there. So I, I think there probably will be some shortening of, of things with that, um, with the K-2. So, um, so thank you. Um, one of the um, most significant pieces of the research that I keep on going back to uh, was when that we met with those doctors down in Saco, and um, someone else was with me when we really pressed the doctor from the Sleep Institute mm -hmm. about the significance of the impact as to whether you switched a half an hour or an hour later. And, and I recall pressing this guy on, on this issue and had him answer to us two or three times when he said that they're really, you're not going to see the impact until there's been an hour. So there's not going to be a difference unless there's an hour difference. So uh, that for me was pretty significant because I felt that just moving the kids a half an hour to an eight o'clock or 10 of eight start time was probably not going to do what we were hoping to get out of this movement at all. So it needed to be the hour. Um, we're a large district geographically, so we have issues in terms of the transportation um, that have to be worked out, but certainly that makes us very different from some of the other towns around us who have already made the movement. Um, and finally, I would say that as, you know, I was a K-5 principal and I was a K-2 principal, and what I saw among our kids was that their greatest amount of work that could be accomplished occurred in the morning. That after 12.30 and 1 o'clock in the afternoon, they still had heavy academic pieces to learn. That was often when we had math and when we had science and social studies added and they were spent. They had had it by then. So I feel strongly about having our kids get the bulk of their academics during the morning for that time. So I will be, ex I will be uh, supporting um, option three. Jody? I just wanted to <coughs> go back to option two to sort of respond to Jackie. And when you first look at that, it seems, it seems like the compromise. But I disagree in that we're then asking the high school kids to, to make a small change, which doesn't get us to the 8.30 time frame, which was one of, of the goals in this whole process. But it's then asking the Wentworth kids, the 3-5 kids, to go in the opposite direction of, of what's best for them, I feel like. We're, so we're uprooting them another, I think it's a half an hour in that um, scenario. And we're virtually not moving the primary kids. So it's not really a compromise. With the definition of a compromise, we all sort of feel a little bit uncomfortable. So with option three for me, I don't love the 8.50 time frame, and I, I don't love the 9 o'clock in the middle school. I would love to see those um, brought closer to 8.45, frankly. Um, and it's, it's moving Wentworth, which is sort of the access, access a little bit, and asking the primary schools for 50 minutes. So everyone is giving a little bit in that scenario, and I think if, if you know, there's been talk about take a two-year two cycle to get this implemented, 
but by doing option two the first year, that second year you're then asking <coughs> the primary kids and the Wentworth kids to go, the first year they, we've swung the pendulum this way, but then in that second year it's a larger disruption to go back to, to some other scenario. So I just think the two-year implementation may be great, but for me the first year is option three with the tweaking of, of the schedule to make that tighter. So and instead I just of thought that, that when, we, when we heard the hour piece of you know, the, an hour would be better, and now we're going an hour and a half at the high school. I just thought that was too much, quite frankly. Hour and 15. I still think it's too much. Mm -hmm. I think going from 7.30 to 9 no. is ridiculous, quite frankly. And I ask each of you who are college graduates, therefore high school graduates, what time did you go to high school? 8.15. And what time was your first class when you were a freshman in college? Nine. I picked my schedule and I made sure I wasn't going. Yes. Well, I didn't have any choice when I went to Orono. We all eight o'clock classes. I'd like to point out too that this um, this science is being recognized by colleges. Duke right. University yes. has in, in, um, really him. right has moved their classes to eight thirty at the earliest. Even Army cadets, the toughest ones around, like the Army has realized, the military has realized that this is a real thing. This um, fleet phase delay, and um, they have even adjusted. Yes. But I also wanted to point out that a vote on the calendar tonight, and then a final vote at our next meeting isn't the end of the conversation about how to make this work in our town. Um, I think that some of the issues that were brought up in terms of um, after school child care with different release times, um, sleep education, so, um, we heard about like the problem of screens, you know, screens in the bedroom. I think that we could um, do some work around um, educating our community about that sleep hygiene, you know, making that really work. Um, so I don't think that even even a final vote on a calendar is the end of a conversation. And I, I was just about to say that before I turned over to Jackie, but I do feel like I, I don't want people to leave here thinking this is the end of the conversation. I truly think that it's the beginning of some sort of implementation um, once that final vote comes. I think we all feel strongly that if we can find five or 10 or 15 minutes here and there, it will make a difference ultimately squeezing that schedule. Okay, so uh, my turn because we're running out of time. Um, one of the biggest criticisms we've heard in a, a lot of emails um, in talking to people is that we're doing this too quickly. And what you're hearing tonight is not a decision already made, which is another point that keeps coming up. It's that we've been at this for two years. We're certain in the science, we're certain in the research we've done over those two years. It's not just a flash in the pan for us. Um, we've been at it and at it and at it, and I'm sorry if it's news to some people, but just in the Scarborough Leader, not the Press Herald forecaster of the current, which also had articles, it's been in nine times in the Leader, thank you Mike Kelly, since um, the first article is October 2nd, 2015, because we met in advance of going to that SACO meeting with the Leadership Council, with the full board, we met and had our own discussion. What would be the benefits, the challenges to the community, to students at every phase level? We went through it all for the first time in September of 2015. We did it again in October in a regional meeting. We've been talking about this for years. We've been doing research on our own. We've been asking surrounding communities. Um, I have scoured the internet and the world. That I have found out what time school starts in surrounding communities around us. We are the earliest high school with the exception of S86. Everybody else starts at eight or later. We have one of the latest starting primary schools of any surrounding school. It's not unusual for primary schools to start at eight. Nationwide, that is more common. We are late to the party in changing school start times and shifting. It's happening across the country. 
the most common way it's accomplished in districts is flipping the schedules. It's a more developmentally appropriate time for elementary students to learn and for high school and middle school students to learn. Um, the research shows that kids are more efficient through the day when they have sleep in the correct time frame for adolescents, and that is between 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. Everything they do through the day is more efficient. There are a ridiculous number of studies, and if it's any indication of how long this has been around, government and science are two of the slowest moving entities on the planet. Um, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, American Medi Medical Association, American Psychological Association, American Sleep Association, American Thoracic Society, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Family Sleep Institute, Maine Sports Medicine Physicians, National Association of School Nurses, National Sleep Foundation, and the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration. All 8.30 and later for middle school and high school students is the recommendation. The American Sleep Association says closer to 9 or later is preferable. Um, the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration just released a study in March of 2017 um, called the Sleep at the Wheel. Drivers 16 to 24 involved in a crash two times as likely to be drowsy compared to drivers 40 to 59. Of all age groups, teens and young adults were most likely to have reported falling asleep at the wheel in the past year. Of all drivers on the road, they're reporting falling asleep. I don't know about you, but that seems like a safety issue for the enti entire town. Our bus schedule as it is now was not developed with science. Our school start times were not developed with science. It's suburban sprawl. Neighborhoods had been built out in places <coughs> where I went to Scarborough High School. There were no houses where I live now. That was woods. It's a factor of what's happened in development in this town. There are now three bus runs. There were not three bus runs before. Um, the average sleep time recommendation from all of the entities I've listed above for kids 6 to 12 is 10 and a half hours. For teenagers, it's 13 to 18 hours. Um, it's nine hours for students 13 to 18. And again, those hours that they're recommending for sleep for the adolescents is between 11 p.m. and 8 a.m. That's the natural circadian rhythm for adolescent minds, brains. And everyone keeps saying, okay, well, what about when they have jobs in, high school, in college and in the real world? The brain chemistry shifts again, and it goes back to an earlier time of day where the melatonin is released. Um, I'm talking quickly, and it sounds aggressive, but I'm really not trying to be. I'm just trying to be fast. Um, the impacts of <coughs> sleep deprivation among um, middle school and high school students include weight gain and eating disorders and obesity, cardiovascular problems, diabetes, reduced immunity, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, mood swings, behavior problems, suicidal ideation, and impact on brain development. It literally saves kids' lives to start school later literally saves lives. That is a fact borne out in the research. For me, the survey um, was a real survey. And again, we've been criti criticized that we already made the decision, so why do the survey? Because we want to know what are the challenges, what benefits do you see, and how can we mitigate those impacts? That is a very real concern for us. And we are taking all of that into consideration in our conversations and discussions. How can we make it easier on parents that need aftercare? We've been in contact with community services. They've told us that they can accommodate aftercare and increase numbers. Um, we're finding that parents are not going to need before care in the numbers that are currently being used in our, um, in our schools. It's not, it's not new to us. That's why it sounds like we're very, um, we're very sure of what we're saying. Um, and, you know, it's an ongoing conversation. It's one we're not going to give up. It's we're trying to compress the time that everyone gets to school in a way that we can do it. It is impossible for us to buy 12, 15 buses. Not this year, not next year, not in 100 years are we going to have in our budget 12 extra buses. For the very practical reason, uh, we can't afford it, and if we could, then we'd have to replace 12 to 15 buses on a three whatever year cycle replacement and we wouldn't be able to afford it on the replacement years. I mean, there's like a billion reasons coursing through my mind right now why we, we couldn't do that. Um, I, 
just and one more thing about buses. Um, I also have looked up the sunrise times for Scarborough, which is even a little further west than Portland. And the latest time, again, is like 7.14. Um, there's only one bus for primary schools right now that starts, um, it's at 8.05, it's bus 14 that goes all the way out to County Road. That is the one outlier bus. The average start time, um, p first pickup for primary runs right now is 8.25. So we push that forward, um, you know, put it onto the new scenario, and kids are not going to be standing outside at 7 a.m. They're just not. Um, and we're trying to avoid that for all phase levels. And that was a goal, that no one's at a bus stop before 7 a.m. Because right now there are kids at bus stops at 6.35 in the morning. That's happening right now. That's not good for anybody of any age. Um, we're trying to do the best for all phase levels, honestly. Honestly, honestly. We are not trading one problem for another. We are doing our best to make accommodations and provide the most um, appropriate and healthy learning environment between the start of school and the end of school. We have no control over anyone's extracurricular activities or what time anyone goes to bed, but it's not a parenting issue to say that high school students are not going to bed before 11. It's not. It's a brain chemistry situation, and it's real, and it shows up in countless journal articles and peer-reviewed studies, and for me, the survey results were almost tied, and in a tie, I go with science. So I support option three of the calendar. Any other comments? I really am just trying to talk fast, and I know it sounds mean, but I'm trying not to be. Um, are we ready to vote for a first reading of the school calendar? Did we? So the um, late starts. Just one comment about that. There's only one per phase level in, on any of these, correct? <laughs> and that is, uh, we're kind of taking a step back to see how those late start times are being used for professional development and hopefully um, addressing that again, again <laughs> the next year in the next calendar. Um, in the following years, there could be more or less, but right now, one per phase level. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, all in favor of option three as the first reading for the school calendar. We are... Six plus one. Thank you. Okay. I'm opposed. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, and all those opposed, one plus one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to move fast. I lose things. Okay, that takes us to. Um, <coughs> Okay, so 11.6 appointments, 11.6.1, high school spring athletic coaches. Okay, 11.6.1, um, high school spring athletic appointments. Various school staff and community members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded um, from the general fund or booster funded. The recommendation is to appoint, appoint the high school spring athletic positions as presented in the agenda, 11.6.1. So moved. Second. Uh, any questions, comments? All in favor? Seven plus two. Thank you. On to uh, 11.6.2, middle school spring athletic coaches. One middle school staff and three community members have been nominated to fill these positions that will be funded from the general fund. The recommendation is to appoint the middle school spring athletic positions as presented in agenda item 11.6.2. So moved. Second. Questions, comments? All in favor? Seven plus two. Okay, great. 11.7, .7, main DOE 2017-18 rating cycle application um, approval, new construction and renovation application. Move okay. approval. Yep. Um, if Todd Jepson is still with us, would you mind coming up, please? <laughs> Hope you've rested during the rest <laughs> of the meeting so you're ready to go. So Todd is our Director of Facilities and Maintenance, and he has been um, given the challenging task of completing four 
rating cycle applications to be submitted to the Department of Education. And um, this has been a very extensive process. Todd has engaged uh, multiple school leaders in this process to put together for uh, really nicely done and thorough applications. And I would just, Todd, if you could speak a little bit to the process um, and what the next steps are for us, that would be appreciated. So the process was uh, started, really started with our long range facilities plan and uh, the collection of data on all of our school facilities uh, with the help of Harriman, uh, Dan Cecil in particular. Um, after that, um, we received the applications um, for the funding. We, there was an announcement that there was going to be a funding cycle this year. Uh, it is due April 14th, which is next Friday. And we received the applications uh, in October, I believe. They were open and available. So we have chosen to, did I make a mistake? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> um, so we chose to apply uh, for four, uh, all four of our six schools, the four that have the modular or otherwise known as portable classrooms to um, remove them, correctly size the buildings uh, as they stand, um, even though many of the alternatives in the long range facilities plan call for a consolidation, um, we know that this town has uh, funded just recently a very big public school. So uh, we have submitted applications for all of that and the process included school leaders, principals, uh, administrators from the central office to fill out program information, uh, facility information, and really rate almost every single space in every single school to see if they think it's adequate. Um, and so these applications over the last really three months have been in force and, and in research mode and then all the information came to me and I've compiled them into these four applications and I have really large supporting documentation piles in my office waiting to be collated and bound together and delivered to the state next week. So one thing I would add that um, in this process, Todd and I uh, took a journey up to Augusta to meet with Scott Brown and speak specifically with him about the process. Um, we're very hopeful that our thorough applications will get a very close look. Um, and then what happens is the Department of Ed comes out and walks through each facility with the principals, with myself, um, with Todd. and. Um, hears right straight from our teachers and sees with their own eyes exactly how, whether the space is adequate or not, whether it's safe or not, whether it's healthy or not. And um, another uh, reason why this is important for us to do is that then any improvements we do upon completing the applications um, are not, the score that we'll earn will be our score so long as we continue to apply, which means that we're held harmless for any improvements um, that we make to our facilities because as Todd mentioned earlier, it's much more cost efficient to be proactive than it is to um, just wait for things to sort of deteriorate and fall apart. Um, and I don't think Scarborough has completed an application like this for over 15 years, uh, which is another point that Scott Brown made is yep. you gotta kind of, you gotta apply to be in the game because <coughs> Um, there is potential that other schools will get funded or again, um, as Todd mentioned, we're applying for all of the problems, not the solutions. So we're applying for four schools. If we became um, a, a top of that list and, we, and the solution became to consolidate our three primary schools, then that would move you up, you know, three schools. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's definitely worth our time and effort and I just really want to thank Todd mm -hmm. um, and our leadership for all of their hard work in, in going through the process. It was a complete team effort and I think it's also important to note that the state doesn't offer a funding cycle every year. The last <laughs> funding cycle was the 2010-2011 year. So y you can see it's, you know, five, six, seven years in between funding cycles. Um, and I was all, we were also told at the DOE that if we had waited to build our Wentworth school, we would have been funded this year. So it would have been seven more years in the old school uh, if we had tried to wait and keep applying for state funding. And if you can believe that, I have a bridge I'll sell you. <laughs> <laughs> we were told twice, don't bother to apply because there right. wasn't enough money and we would never have made the list. So. <laughs> 
We were number 78 on a list of 92 the last time Wentworth was applied for in 2001. Right. Mm -hmm. So, But I think that this is a symbol of how, how dedicated our leadership is to our mission to truly do whatever it takes. We are seeking every possible avenue we can um, to bring uh, financial support for, to our town so that our schools can have the very best possible facilities and education possible. So I commend our leadership for all of their hard work. And, and thank you for all the uh, support you gave for these applications because it was a lot. <laughs> thank you. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Any approve all four. Yes. In all one fell swoop. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Just want to Any clarify. comments or? I just want to, I just would like to thank everyone who took the time to do this because it's a ton of work I can imagine um, and I think I think it's great that you've you've gone up to Augusta and you've you've spoke to the people that need to hear from us and I'm hopeful and just so the people know Scott Brown is is with the Department of Education we've mentioned his name we didn't yeah. say what is mm -hmm. his role <laughs> Any, anyone else Okay, all in favor of approving all four applications. Seven plus two, and it is 10 o'clock, 12.0, adjournment. Do I have a motion? So move, move to move. adjourn. Third Second. Second. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.